the best time of the day to eat a high-protein meal is breakfast time. In the morning. High-protein breakfast helps regulate <sighs> insulin and blood sugar throughout the day, helps control your appetite throughout the day, um, and is great for muscle recovery. It also helps you hit your protein targets because when you get behind the eight ball, uh, as the day goes on, it's really hard to hit those targets, especially if you need to eat a high protein diet. Is there is that a, a generic tip that you came up with, or is there actually research no, to support lots, that it's? Yeah, no, lots of research. So, um, lots of studies showing that if you start the day with protein, the ups and downs you get in blood sugar, regardless of what you eat. So, if if you eat high sugar later, or whatever, the ups and downs are more bl are blunted in comparison to how they would be had you started the day with a high sugar, high carbohydrate meal or no meal whatsoever. So what it does is it helps regulate blood sugar throughout the day, regardless of what you eat. Now, why is that important? Because blood sugar highs and lows definitely contribute to behaviors um, that can, mm. like, for example- Energy you know, levels for sure. Energy levels, irritability, uh, cravings, and hunger. So when you control those, you're, you're, you're in a better place to make better food uh, choices. Um, so that's yeah. one of the main reasons. And then of course, protein. Well, yeah. Not to mention it's hard to get protein at the end of the day. Like if yeah. you're behind, uh, you know, to get it in early, you have a lot better chance of hitting your targets. Yeah. And it's also, um, I mean, it, it really produces great satiety. You know, I've been working with my cousin and he's been having me do like, uh, his macros and stuff. And I told you guys about this, right. I'm having him track a couple things. And all I did <clears throat> was tell him, Try to hit 200 grams of protein a day. He's uh, he's a big dude, about 215. And now the two weeks is up. I had him do this for two weeks. We tracked his body weight this whole time. He got leaner and he built muscle. And he didn't do anything else. He wasn't trying to eat less. He wasn't trying to do anything else. All he was doing is trying to hit 200 grams. And he told me, he goes, it's really hard yep. to hit 200 grams a day. And it makes me feel like not hungry. And I said, that's that's the whole point. But he has to start his day with like, 50 40, grams of 40, 50 grams at least. Otherwise you screwed. Yeah, I mean, that to me, when I think of back on like all the 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 little hacks that were like somewhat basic that um, I implemented into my life that made a, a big impact on whatever my fitness goals were, I, for sure the the dinner one that I talk about where I say, you know, plan your, your, your dinner that most people do that's kind of centered around, for the most part, like a meat, right? Like yeah. a meat heavy type of dinner. And just keep, you know, a, a good portion of that for breakfast and just add eggs, eggs and cheese to it. And a high you, protein scramble. Yeah. You got this protein scramble in the morning. That's, you know, 40, 50 grams of protein. And it sets the tone for the day aside from the benefits of what it does for behaviors around cravings, which to me is just like a side benefit. The, my main reason for implementing that had nothing to do with that. It was like, man, I struggled like he did to hit 200 and something grams of protein every day if I did not actively go after 40 to 50 grams right out the gates. Otherwise, I found myself at noon, one, two o'clock going, oh shit, I've had 10 grams of protein and I got to get 190 more in the next, you know, five to eight yeah. hours. Like that's tough to do, right? Yep. Especially if you're eating, you know, relatively healthy and clean. It's really tough to one, do. One of the big challenges with uh, breakfast is that breakfast tends to be the meal that's the most rushed, right? So if you think of lunch, we tend to have a lunch break. Um, if dinner, we're home, we could take our time. Breakfast, it's like, get up, I got a little bit of time, got to go to work, got to take the kids to school. So the problem, the challenge with a high-protein breakfast is that protein, you have to cook it. It's not like in a box of cereal or whatever for the most yeah, part. Yeah, but we have a situation. Okay, we have like the creatures of habit. Like their I oatmeal, was just going to say. Yeah. Their oatmeal's got 30-something grams. I actually think that the challenge is more just around the marketing. Yeah. We've marketed to people that breakfast is this, you know, cereal, waffle, pancake. Super carb-loaded meal. Yeah, yeah, and even like the, the, the most breakfast food. Uh, is like uh, an egg that is got some source of good protein or would be a good choice would be eggs. And you know how many eggs it takes to get 40, 50 grams? Yeah, I, just, eat, I eat eight, eight eggs every day to hit. Yeah, breakfast. and that's just not – most people don't do that, no, right? You're, you're, you're a bit of an anomaly, uh, if, especially if you, you carve out the, the bodybuilding community. Outside of that, I don't know anyway. Like, There's no average American. I'm like, hey, what do you have for breakfast? They're like, oh, 12 eggs. <laughs> yeah. you know, nobody says that. No. You know? So it's, most people are eating – regular oatmeal or they're you know eating cereal or they're having pancakes or they're having waffles all these are super and, and that's why i was going to say because yes you could have a protein shake but then some people are like ah, but i want to eat something 
I don't just want to have a protein shake. Uh, Creatures of Habit's great because it's oatmeal with 30 grams of protein. And so you literally just- Fiber too. So yeah, you know. fi- yeah, fiber. It's got probiotics, fi- vitamin D. So you literally just, you know, I, I like the maple one, whatever. The, uh, maple, I don't know. I think the flavor is just maple. War, you know, add water or almond milk and then there you go. And sometimes I'll do two of them. I'll do two of them and give me 60 grams of protein. And good complex carbohydrates. That I haven't done. I haven't doubled it up. It's one's been enough for me. I mean, it's, it's uh, one, one. It's it's good. It's pretty dense too. It's it's just one packet of. Yeah, no. One of them. One of them feels good. I haven't had. A, I haven't done two yet. I wonder how two would sit sit with me if it, if easy I, to digest. Dude. Yeah, well, because it's the, the he uses the vegan protein in there, right? Yeah. So I mean, I'm sure that I would digest it a lot better than like no doubling up of whey. Yeah, it's no problem. So. You know, speaking of eggs, so I go to the grocery store yesterday. <laughs> this whole egg shortage thing is pretty pretty um, unnerving for me. <laughs> Cause, did cause you see? Did like you eggs. see Justin's meme? Yes. <laughs> I just saw it. I was in the restroom. I started laughing. <laughs> oh, dude, I saw it. Oh, like, you, did you, did you did not go That's there. You did not go there. Yeah, thinking. I'm going there. I'm, was, off. I'm like throttled down. Was that, hey, was that a listener that sent it to you? Yes. Yeah, I love our me. audience, dude. Yeah, that know. you know the coolest, maybe the coolest thing about reaching. It's fun. The size that we have is that we have gathered enough thousands of people that are like minded. And so yeah. I don't even have to scour the internet sometimes no. for such good stuff. They just <laughs> no. I just open my DMs and back, I get, back when I used to be on Instagram, such a, such a privilege. People ask me where I used to get my memes. I didn't have to fi- find memes. No, I know people you had like four or five dudes that were like just send them. By the way, uh, I may be able to get back on Instagram. We don't know what's going to happen, but I might be able to get back on. Don't I don't tease believe me. I don't believe. And me. if that happens, oh, what do you what do you guys think? If I get back on, because I'm not going to start a new account. But let's say they let me back on. Uh, how long do you think it would take for me to get kicked off again? Well, it depends. A year? Are you going mean, to How hard are you going to go out of the gates? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, what, are you, you going to Twitter it? I mean, the way you did your, your no. tweeting. I mean, I imagine it won't be long before they get rid of you again. <laughs> so if you go that route. <laughs> yeah. um, you, know, I, I, the, you know, the thing that I think is most interesting to me about that whole situation is actually the how insignificant. It is. I mean, kudos to the the model, the business model that we built. Because obviously, nine, ten years ago, even before Mind Pump existed, you know, I turned on yeah. YouTube and Instagram and Facebook with the intent of building a business around it. And of course, if I'm building a business around it, I would think that it would require that monster to keep yeah. going. To I had like a hundred something thousand followers and I was pretty active. You know, yeah, people yeah, no, were on it. For but sure. I, I, they booted me and it really didn't touch the business, which no. is great. And I think no. if you own a business that you need, you should set it up that way to where one leg of the business doesn't, especially in social media because they control it, right? You don't own your content on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. They do. And that's a dangerous position. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see young entrepreneurs make right now is, and it's tough because I get it, right? So one of the advices I give around you know, building a social media brand is to find which medium works best for you. Or, or do you, mm-hmm. you do you say short and witty things, go to Twitter. If you like imagery and stuff like that, go to Instagram. If you like long form podcasts, I mean, long form written stuff, do Facebook or do blogs. like Or Substack. A lot of people are doing Substack. Yeah, Substack or you like blogs. talking yeah. for a long period of time, do podcasts or YouTube. And so what ends up happening is people move into one of those, they have success, and then they kind of just stay there, neglect the other yeah. ones and not realize the value. I remember hearing Gary Vee years ago, and I just think it's, he looked at social media as, as acquiring real estate and that you want to have some sort of real, it doesn't mean that you can't have a bulk of your investing in one state or in one type of product, like say, you know, duplexes you have mostly there, but to, to diversify amongst all of them in case we have like what happened to you where like, you know, your Instagram all of a sudden gets shut down. Imagine if the entire business was attached to it your would, Instagram. It would have been terrible. I had a, I had a buddy who was doing Facebook ads for his company and he went from making, here's just another example. You don't even have to get kicked off. He was making seven hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue from his Facebook uh, account with ads. They changed the algorithm. He went from making seven hundred to seventy. That's overnight. Crazy. Overnight, yeah. Overnight. I've heard a lot of those cases. It's that's frightening. It's just putting too much, giving too much of your power away to someone else. Back, back to the eggs. Play by their rules. Back to the eggs. So I want to, I want to bring this up. So because here's what's happening. I don't know if it's happening everywhere, but it's happening around here. I go to the grocery store, I walk in, there's eggs, and there's a sign that says only two items per customer. So they're rationing eggs 
uh, Dude. so that people don't. And now, how many you ate every morning? Yeah, so I'm gonna have to go every day. <laughs> I was gonna say, like, what does that look like? For so you, you know, when do, when do people start shaming you? <laughs> I eat I'm them. Gonna, I don't I'm throw gonna, them away. I'm gonna start start, start shaming you. Yeah, yeah. somebody else is starving of eggs. I would. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I would uh, try shaming me for eating eggs. Sell the egg hoarder. And then show me your grocery <laughs> cart. No, but here's what's dumb about this, okay? They're doing, I know why they're doing this, because they are trying to limit the amount of, the, how the price fluctuates and how expensive they're going to get. Yeah. This is why that's dumb. In the short term, they think they're helping people. But in reality, what they're doing is they're not allowing the pricing signals to accurately reflect the supply and demand. Now, why is that important? Because if we let the egg prices reflect the true supply and people buy them and then they run out and then the prices yeah. go up even more and then people buy them and they run out and the prices go up even more, that sends a very powerful signal to suppliers to make more and produce more eggs and more suppliers will enter into the market. So if we let the prices accurately reflect what's going on, we'll get the supply up faster yeah. than if we ration them. This is just, you know, how can I, so when I walk in, I see them like, oh, this is so People dumb. can't see beyond just the price point. Yeah. Though, you know, I know. So that's <laughs> where we're at. Oh, Want to piss off Sal, piss off, do something with the free market, right? That shakes up the free market some way. Especially when that takes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now you're getting into my space. Yeah. It makes me so. I'm an egg so eater. Much. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Here's the giveaway for today's episode Maps Anabolic, a very popular Maps workout program. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments, okay? We won't let you know anywhere else, just in the comments. That's how you know you won. Um, also, we have these three bundles going on right now. Each one of them gives you up to nine months of planned workouts, so nine months long, and they're all $300 or more off. Huge promotion because it's January, so you want to take advantage of this. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Dude, I got it. Did you? Oh, you guys didn't even see this. So I'm surprised you guys didn't see this. She didn't tag anybody, but um, which is probably why. So um, in our forum, one of our forum members, very fit young lady, followed map symmetry and she did DEXA scans before and then two months later. So 60 days. Okay. This is all map symmetry. So she followed map symmetry. Nothing else really changed. Diet was the same. Everything was pretty good. She gained three pounds of muscle, lost eight pounds of body fat, which is great. But here's the real cool wow. thing. You guys have done DEXA scans before? Have you? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. So, I don't know if I have. I have. So DEXA scan will show, um, you know, like lean body mass on one side versus the other side. Yeah. So to give you an example, her left leg had 18.7 uh, pounds of lean body mass. Her right leg had 19.2 pounds of lean body mass. After map symmetry, the left leg, 19.1 pounds of lean body mass. The right leg, 19.2. Almost oh. became completely balanced. Wow. Same thing happened to her arm. That's sick. Where the arms went from the left being smaller than the right. After map symmetry, right and left were identical. So it literally balanced out her right and left as evidenced Did by- Did you send that to Doug? Well, I was trying right. to find that it on the like form. The I wanted to see it. Example. I didn't see it. Did you, do you see it, Doug? Yeah. I don't. Her yeah. name is Amber Horton, and um, she's in our private form, that and she posted it. What this. a cool way to yeah assess that, too. I do. I encourage people. If yeah, you what have, a great idea. If you have access, because the DEXA scan is the only thing that'll show- Oh, you pulled it up there, Doug? What What does the right, uh, the, right the left arm- I kind of cut it off. Did it show there? That's, uh, that's Andrew, not- Oh, me. Andrew, sorry. Six pounds of lean body mass on the left arm, 6.3 on the right arm. After map symmetry, 6.3, 6.3. So everything literally balanced out. That's cool. Uh, you know what's wow, cool? Wow, look at her, like 18.7, 19.2, then 9.1, 19.1, Now, how big of a difference do you think will, this will make on things like barbell squats, deadlifts, bench of press, course, right? press? Of course, right? Of course. Yeah, you're much more balanced. Like, your output's going to be louder because it's like... You know, you're getting it from both sides equally. Now, here's something else about this that's that dawned on me when I saw this. Because she's obviously very fit. She's not a beginner. So she, she doesn't look like that because she did map symmetry. She's already really fit. And you'll see if you watch this on YouTube, we'll post her picture. But here's what's interesting. At, after a certain point when you've been working out for a while, it's really hard to build muscle. <clears throat> this is in a phenomenal way to uh, basically introduce novelty and bring up a weak body part and then just add muscle to your body. Had she not followed map symmetry, she would not have built as much muscle 
because her body was already so accustomed to doing things bilaterally. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So because she did the unilateral training and the way we design map symmetry is really bring balance between the right and left, because she did that and it was so novel, not only did she balance right and left out, she also built more muscle had she not done that at all, had she followed some other program, even one of our other programs. Right, she would have kept prioritizing the That's same right. way she lived, which one would build up the stronger side and That's not right. necessarily get that cool, kind of game. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah, yeah I didn't even so see So if anybody's that, following Map Symmetry, try that. Go get a Dexta sand before and after and see it, how balanced out it makes the right and left. And then, of course, aesthetically speaking, when things are more balanced, um, we all know that symmetry, well, we don't all know, but science shows that symmetry is a, is a very strong predictor of what you know, people would consider beauty, right, or aesthetics. So it really balances out the body, yeah. remarkably. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Wow, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was uh, that was uh, pretty rad, dude. Um, did you guys see? So okay, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this one guy who got like a viral video out there. He was a homeless guy. His name was Kai. I'm Kai. Kai, can I get spelling for you? Straight out of Dogtown, K A I. Um, he's famous for, I guess, like Kai, the homeless guy. Yeah. He, he, Kai, the homeless guy. He was, um, he had this interview and, um, was, I guess his, his famous catchphrase was like smash, 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 smash. And he was on like Jimmy Kimmel show and all this stuff because he saved some lady, uh, that was, um, I guess getting like. Um, abuse or, or oh. something from this guy. It, th the story is crazy. It goes back to like show you like how um, as as media picks up on these kind of like viral sensation people, like they don't do a lot of good investigation and homework on the actual character of the person oh, first. No. Uh, and so it unfolds later and you start to find out like what a absolute creep this guy was. Oh, really? Yeah, and like how... so. So everybody was like, Kai's great. He's yeah, awesome. originally he was like in a van with this guy who, I guess, so the narrative was like he, this guy in this van this, um, hit uh, some some other guys, this black guy, and they kind of made it like a um, like a racial thing. Like he was like targeting like this this black guy and trying to, to, to hurt him with, with the van and then gets out. And then um, this lady comes over to help, seeing thinks it's just an accident. And then the guy gets out and, and starts attacking the lady uh, that's trying to help. And then Kai, the homeless guy that's in the car, gets out and then, like, he has a hatchet on him. And so then he hits the blunt side of the hatchet on top of the guy's head, like, twice, and then turns it and, and hits it with the other side, which then leaves, like, a gouge in the guy's head. Anyway, the guy goes to the hospital, all this stuff. The, the media picks it up as, like, this heroic story. Right, like like Kai, like save this lady. Wait, 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 hold on. That was the good thing. I mean, he defended her, but holy shit, he used it. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, so a little bit of a red flag. Like the guy's a little violent. You know, like he's got a little bit of violent tendencies here. He just swept over because yeah, whatever. They just wanted to create and run with. Doug, can you be pulling up some articles for me or something like this while he's talking about this? I yeah. So. It's really a fascinating um, human psychology kind of like documentary. Like it goes through this whole thing of like uh, how he just was this crazy rambunctious kid who would like. So you get one story from one person that was like his mom was abusive by locking him in his room. And, uh, and then her story is that he was so unpredictable and crazy that she had to lock him in the room. Otherwise, he was going to hurt himself and other people. And so it's like. He's a convicted murderer. Yeah. Oh, and he's a hitchhiker, not a not a bomb. He's not homeless. Oh, he's a hitchhiker. Well, whatever. That was the that was like the title of like it was Kai the homeless guy. But yeah, he's he's a uh, hitchhiker. Wow. Oh, okay, so it still makes sense. So he's just he's probably he's a nomad, right? But he's a nomadic. Yeah, he's, he's not like he. Right, right, right. Where was this out of, Justin? Uh, and, L.A., I believe. And was the this is like a net, they did like a Netflix documentary on it? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So the Netflix documentary gets into all the details and everything, but I just I thought it was crazy because it's like he's this viral sensation, and then like in, and everybody was gonna pay him so much money to be like interviewed and all this stuff, and the, half the story is just all these like networks trying to get him, and he wouldn't like agree to it and then finally one person can find him because he's like this uh nomadic hitchhiker guy that like nobody could find and so this this guy like that was his uh like like had some connection to like a jimmy kimmel show finally gets him and then gets him on the show 
And then uh, later on, like his rise to fame, just like completely. I'm always super skeptical of, of, I I think it's so interesting how we, um, you know, glorify the famous actors and actresses and you're, we're quick to jump on because it makes a good story. It's like, oh my God. Or even like when people ask me questions about like, you know, uh, you know, what athletes do you admire or what, you know, it's like, there's, I just. I don't admire athletes. I mean, I, I respect and think it's amazing what they do. I don't by any means for their athletic skill. Perhaps. Yeah, I don't take anything from from what they do on the court. I think it's uh, you know, like Michael Jordan is. That's where I, yeah, I get I mean, my how to be a better father. Yeah, <laughs> like I, there's I don't exactly. admire him, right? Yeah. Like I respect his game, and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. That's so sick. Like that's cool. But I don't because of that. What he, his discipline to become great at a sport or great at acting or fill in the blank. I don't all of a sudden translate into like I should admire this person, you know, or yeah. I should emulate. It also does, who does they it, are as a person because they have this one characteristic. And it, yeah, and it doesn't mean they're great at anything else. Right. So I mean, they have one great that is great characteristic yeah. that made them like stand out from everybody else. But they could be terrible at all these other things. Dude, so. you know how how yeah. weird is it that a few like a I don't know I don't know six decades ago or so it was not uncommon for people to hitch rides. I know, like people used to hitchhike all the time. Oh yeah, all the time. Y- you know how what's wild funny that? about that too is like uh, we didn't have like that immediate information access either. Like I guarantee it was way more dangerous than they way more they presented it back even in the seventies. Right, was, that's like the the start of all the serial killers. It was so accepted. This is real now. This is a toy. That it's was so created. dangerous. They created a toy in the 60s. I don't remember the name of it. Maybe Doug could find it. But literally, a kid would fill out a form with their name and their address and whatever, and they'd leave it somewhere. And people would, the, 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 the toy essentially was that it hitchhiked all the way back to you. So you'd travel somewhere, drop it off, and then people would pick it up and, oh, I'm going in that direction. And they'd pass it along. And then maybe you'd come and get it and be like, oh, it came back to me. And then parents realized, this has my kid's name and address on it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real thing? Yes. Look that up. What is that? Yes. I didn't even know that was the a real kid's thing. The kid's hitchhiking toy. I mean, I've to- I think I've told you guys before in high school, it was- it <laughs> Is was- Tommy here? I got your toy. <laughs> hey, Tommy. <Yeah. laughs> when we were in high school, uh, a, a common prank <laughs> we used to do is, because uh, it was that common that you, it, we there was always a hitchhiker in town. Always. Like all through high school, you every day you saw at least one. That's how common it was. It was yeah. that common. And I don't know if that's because where I grew up, Oakdale was this like commuter town where like it's yeah. the last main stop before. I never to, really saw much before you go to Yosemite or if you could be going the other direction before you go to the Bay Area. It's like this first most. So I think a lot of people would hitchhike from there. Um, so in high school, it was it was just like a, a common prank that you you see one and then you you pull over like 50 yards up and you go, hey, come on. And you get him to run and then you take off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you wow. Like, we used to do that all the time. It was just like a stupid high school kid yeah. thing. You know what I'm right, saying? It just would be hilarious to get him. Like, they'd be running with their bags and shit falling. And so like that, come on, hurry up. All come excited. On. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all excited. That's so mean. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, it's not if they were a serial killer, right? If you have oh. a different view on it, if there's a good chance that one of them was a serial killer. I mean, that we, statistically speaking. <laughs> yeah, 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 there's I did it that much that we for sure sped off on at least one serial yeah, killer. Yeah, I, I'm sure. trying to find What's it because I'm trying to find the name of the toy. I'm, yeah. I'm helping you look here, Doug. So either so so you're in this situation, right? So either the hitchhiker because usually they're armed, right? So this guy had a uh, uh, an axe, yeah. right? Had a hatchet on him, yeah. right? Or you're the driver that has like a gun or like whatever in there, and it's like, what are the motivations of both parties? You know, like coming into that uh, situation, it's just like it's all bad. Oh, that's yeah. A, that's yeah. But you know, you know what else? What other toy was totally changed? You, you guys ever try to buy a Slinky? It's yeah. not at all the same. What? what? Really? Uh, like the the latest ones? They're, they're plastic. They're metal. Oh, they, they don't oh, make the real heavy metal, like yeah. amazing ones that we had. When we were yeah, playing. but is there any other logic other than it's cheap? No, it's, it's because cheap, right? the metal was people kids would wrap wrap around each other's necks. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why? Yeah. No. Bro, you can't buy. I know. I'm not disagreeing you can't buy it, but I would think it's because it's expensive. It's because I think the metal was sharp and kids were hurting each other because they were tied around. Really? I'm pretty sure my brother says, did Doug? that to me. Yeah, I don't know. I'm still trying to find his hitch- hitchhiker thing. It's a, yeah, he's made up two things today in this episode no, already. No, it's yeah. real. Two things. 
It's real. I bet Andrew will find it. It's an old toy. I want to say from the sixties or seventies. I did not know that they had to cancel. I've never heard that. Yeah. Uh, No, no. So the original slinkies are like heavy metal. And I know they would actually yeah because you watch them go the stairs and they. So I would imagine the plastic plastic one won't even. No, they don't. I've actually I've actually tried to use the plastic. They suck. They totally suck. They don't have enough. So yeah, it's like what's the point? They, they still make metal see, slinkies. Yeah, I well, go this. find one of the th- uh, somewhere. I couldn't yeah, find it's one. It's because of money, Target. bro. It's because they're cheap. Amazon. Uh, it's because they're right. cheap. Well, I went, I the went reason to the why store. they went to plastic is that that much metal compared to that much plastic is nothing now. Yeah. It's like cents on the dollar. I was dollar. like, oh, this will be fun. And I'm like, look, you know, this is not going to be fun. This is stupid. Did you find his, yeah, his that'd be pointless gamers are the second one. thing he made up? No. Yeah, I found the slinkies Oh, see, now it's like science tools or whatever. Oh, the original. You got to buy the original. It's stupid, dude. Okay, so give it. Is it? You want to strangle your you're, not, you're not going to let him lie twice people. in a podcast, are you? Find it. Find I'm not going to find the other one, so we'll, we'll keep looking. <laughs> I couldn't two, find it. Two lies in one podcast. We're not even, <laughs> you might have to go to the dark web this. for that one. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't yeah. find it. Anyway, speaking of uh, of homeless people, did you guys see that, that viral clip? Speech. Yeah, that viral clip of that, that store owner in San Francisco? Oh, I was going to bring that up. Okay, so that was uh-huh. on. That was on my notes. Yeah, Oh, so they talked about that um, on the All In podcast, Yeah, that's why it was on my notes. Did you hear about this? No, no, tell me. There's this art gallery owner it's a small business and just you know how san francisco is lately it's just the the homeless people camp out anywhere and the cop police can't do anything about it and yeah you know, they just kind of take doing over. drugs so this person's business is just tanking which yeah. first of all owning a business storefront in san francisco anyway is like you're probably going to fail it's hard yeah but now on top of it they have she's got this this business owner has homeless people camped out in front can't do anything about it can't get rid of them so the viral video is them coming out with a water hose and spraying. Oh, them. I saw that video. Blasting the, the guy's blasting the yeah, layout. Yeah. Or I mean, the guy's on all in. I mean, Sal I obviously that, presented yeah. it to support our argument um, for, sure, for sure, the way he presented it. It yeah. was presented different on the other. The way it was presented on the all in podcast. It's mean that you're spraying. Jason, it. yeah, Calcanis presented it, who's a bit of the, you know, the, the woke one of the four of them and he presented as like never is it okay to like spray a homeless person I can't believe he did that and then the other guys they, they had a nice little debate and conversation about it like but if they who's, throw poo on you well that's I mean that's the other guys were like well you know what we don't know is what how did it escalate to that I mean do yeah. you think the store owner just walked out and saw a homeless guy on the curb and then just started blasting him or had there been a series of altercations and conversations and please leave my store and hey I'll shit on I'll shit on the front of your door yeah. if I want to. like you don't know what was said and who's in the right or wrong in that situation yeah, I don't know if I'd go out and like I don't know how I'd react if I had a small business with someone no, doing it's, that it's, it's I think that's mean or whatever I don't think that's cool either oh I know for but, sure I would do that if that person escalated it in other ways too because like you're not going to that what you're not going to do is well, beat him up, no, right? No. So, like, if if let's like literally, if he yeah, shit, if won't move. If he shit in front of like as a f you, like like if I said, please move away from my store. Like you, people are afraid to come in because you're you're camping on the floor in front of my store, and he didn't. And then I asked again, and he goes, "I'll shit in front of your door." And then he shits yeah. in front of my door. I would absolutely spray Which, his ass with a hose. Yeah. I guarantee, I would. yeah, that's a likely scenario. I mean, I unfortunately, like, I used to be very like, I'm going to help and like do whatever I can. And you know, when you live in it, it's it gives you a completely different perspective. Well, you you think about your family, you think about your own business, and then you real, and you're also it's also frustrating because what they need is mental health services that's what and, needs to happen and they need help with drug abuse well there's the, the vast majority of them that's the compassion argument it's a lot argument. less of like down and out and more of a mental illness 100% problem. That's, that's the compassion argument there cuz right cuz even even the statement that i said i would absolutely spray them if they did x y and z i mean does that story change uh, if, if they're like crazy if they're crazy right yeah. and they're mentally ill and i do that like right? i don't know i think when you're in that situation you if i if i were to escalate it to that point Huh? Watch out. I probably I probably tried t- other ways first, you know, to get the person to yeah. do it. And then yeah. they have escalated to a point where I can't take it to that level because I'll be a really bad person if I get yeah, physical. Yeah, it's a touchy, you- touchy subject for people that are on the outside, especially. Yeah. Because, like, too, I've seen businesses decimated downtown Santa Cruz because people would literally vandalize every single day. Yeah. Every single day. Yeah. And, like, go through the trash and then, like, like, put their shit and smear it on their windows and like just like abhorrent stuff. This is a, it's a mental health and drug abuse crisis that's being politicized as a housing shortage No, yeah. and no, a it's job a health shortage. Problem. It's yeah. not, it's not shortage of jobs. It's not that there's a shortage of housing. It's 
that they that there's lots of mental illness and then the and especially in San Francisco the ease of access to some of these drugs in fact mm -hmm. they will give you drugs yeah. mm -hmm. they will they they will put you in an area and they'll give you a supply of yeah. drugs and money madness and so you'll actually there's actually people Enabling. interview and and they'll take them down on social media but the interviews if you see them before they get taken down are these homeless people like oh yeah like why would i leave they i get free drugs i get yeah. i get money to buy food. There's no stipulation. They're not saying, hey, you can't do drugs here if we feed you or whatever. So um, there's an issue there. Uh, and, and I think they need to be put in mental health um, services. Yeah. I wouldn't mind paying for that at all. Right. Because that would help the issue. Otherwise, we're stuck with this. Like, what do you do? 100% uh, agree. It's, yeah. That's the, the only solution I see. And it's just really, it, 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 everything I've seen personally and like everybody that lives within the proximity of it, it's like, it's just, it's not, <laughs> there, there's not a lot of them looking for uh, aid and help to get on their feet or anything, which is what you would hope. You're not yeah. in the right state of mind. So to ask them if you're, if you're, if you're in that place, if you've ever dealt with somebody like a friend or family member that's really addicted to substances or is just not all there, they, they don't want help or they don't even know that they need help or yeah. they think you're crazy. Yeah. So it's like, what do you do? What do you do at that point, right? So oh, it's a tough, yeah, one. really, really tough uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I was reading this article on at home workouts and the pandemic, which now we've obviously been out of it for a little while, but during that period of time, a lot of people obviously started working out at home. They recently did another survey of these people. The majority of them, 60 something percent, say, I'm going to continue just to work out at home and not go back to the gyms. I mean, it happened to me. Yeah. Remember, if you remember, before, oh, you were against it. I was, yeah, I was uh, totally. You know what it did? It just conditioned me, and I said, eh, at this point, and I, I still stand by the original things that I said about why I like going to the gym. Mm -hmm. The truth is, it forced me to figure out what it was like to not have that, and so I've learned to focus on the aspects I like about have just working out at home, yeah, the convenience, yeah. yeah. You know, and so now I'm like, well, you know, like where I'm at in my life right now, if I was like competing for a show, okay, it would be a different story. I, I would need that external motivation and the hype of someone else training near me. Yeah. And like, I don't give a shit, you know, or I'd want the diversity of all the different machines stuff like that. With my PRX setup, I yeah. mean, I got everything that I need to keep a healthy, strong, fit physique. And so it's like... And I, and ever since, especially since we've done maps 15 and stuff like that, <laughs> I've really kind of adopted this. I'm in a really different place lifting wise in my life than I've ever been. Um, it's, it's been solely motivated off of how I look for most of my life. And I, I really say fatherhood has really shifted that more than anything. Although I was already after bodybuilding, I really wanted to get away from that. Cause I got really tired of being like, like you know, pigeonholed into being the bodybuilder guy. So there was a part of me that like revolted. You, you got sick of being objectified for your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> not it's, a piece of meat. I did not get, I didn't like I being, hate being so sexy. I time. didn't know. Yeah. Not that at all. That part I liked. I did not get, I did not like it. I did not like being labeled though as like the bodybuilder guy because yeah. it's just not who I was. And so I think it started there. And then the pandemic, fatherhood, all kind of pushed me into this different direction. And now you know, my training truly is to complement my my life versus like this thing that I was doing for such a long time to obtain kind of a look. Now you knew logically that the tons of variety at the gym with all the different machines, all that stuff, you knew logically, because we would talk about this, that it really wouldn't make a difference in terms of what kind of results you can get on that stuff. But now that you're doing it and you're working out, because what do you have? You have a PRX rack, yeah. barbell, weights, dumbbells, adjustable yeah. bench. Right? Yeah, okay. easy curl bar and stuff like, like that. Like basic home gym stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Now that you have that and you're going through it, like, did, is anything surprising you about how, like, you don't need tons of things or whatever? Well, or is you it know, all because you knew it already. Well, you know what? I, what is what is interesting? And so I think the biggest thing that I that I noticed is this. Okay, so let's say I went to the gym and it was an unmotivated day. And I think you can relate to this because I think we've talked about this before. Unmotivated or just not feeling great. And so that might be a day where I spend 50 minutes of like machine stuff. Oh, I see. How, getting a little pump and so that calling workout. That obviously doesn't happen now. 
So if I have an unmotivated day, I'll actually probably train less time, but I'll do one or two very effective movements. Oh. I will deadlift or I will squat. So the efficiency is much higher. Yeah. So it's actually kind of interesting the like what happens now. Like the if I drove to the gym and I did not want to be there and I got there, I stay there still for an hour. Yeah. But then the the way I mosey around the gym, the exercises that I choose are, you know, cable stuff, yeah. pec deck. Just sit on a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just kind of but but I can get a little pump and then feel like, okay, I, I did the work mm -hmm. today. So I didn't I didn't not not go. Where now I won't stay in my garage gym for an hour just to just to see because I went there. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh, I am not, I don't feel like it today, but you know what? I can do three sets of squats. Yeah. And, and I'll then I'll make this commitment that I'm only gonna do that. And then I'll go do that. Many times that leads to another exercise or two or like more of a routine like MAPS 15 looks like. And I end up doing that. And I find that I'm I'm getting probably better benefits because of so crazy. the extra exercise selection, which nothing I could have, I don't think I could have foreseen that yeah. until I just kind of went through it and then being totally honest with myself and removing it and going like, okay, what are the pros and cons? of of this you know having just this prx situation at home and not getting the gym like i i i know that i admittedly like and think is superior yeah. uh i i've found that there's benefits that i didn't think i was going to see from having the i've noticed the same it's very much more of an efficiency thing mm -hmm. like uh, in that environment because it's like i'd if you're in the actual like commercial gym it is it's nice to kind of just drift around and like try all the different types of machines or do things you like wouldn't typically do. But for me and like my home gym, it's like, okay, I'm here. It usually is like a five by five or like I'm just doing the compound lifts and I'm out. You yeah. know, it's like, I'm, I'm not like no fluff. Like my workout um, time is, is gone almost in half. It's like 30 minutes or it's the 15 minute protocol. Have you yeah. guys tried, you guys haven't tried the all day workout yet, right? Were, were you I've done so I haven't done exactly like a protocol like you have but already a few times Katrina and I have done these like we go out three visit. three to four ten minute bouts isn't it wild yeah no I, I mean I, I love it that's what I mean like it's my way of training is really it's very unstructured in the sense that I'm not like following this protocol of this is what exercise I do on these days and rest periods and this that it's like I have more of this attitude of I understand very much so the value of all these movements. And sometimes I only commit to going in and doing the, that one movement. And what that leads to many times, either me st staying in there longer and doing more, or I felt so good. The rest of my day is energized. I find another 10 minute break. I come back in, do another movement and then go back to my day, I'm do my thing, come back, do another movement. I, people need to try this. If you have a home gym, this is hard to do with a gym, gym, but if you have a home gym, what I would do is every other hour, I would do like three sets of two exercises and they were big gross motor movement movements. So like squats and bench press. And I would do that every other hour starting at 9 a.m. And I would stop somewhere around 4 or 5 p.m. And I'd feed myself in between, make sure I had protein, carbs, the whole deal. The intensity was moderate, so I wasn't hammering myself. The total volume that I would add up of squats and bench press, for example, in that, in that scenario... <laughs> was so much higher than I would ever do during a regular workout because it was so spread out. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel nearly the fatigue that I should have. And some weird things would happen. I would get stronger halfway through, which is weird. After three or four of them, I was like, I all of a sudden got hella stronger. And then the days afterwards, I felt like it's that feeling you get when you do like a new super effective routine where you could tell like, oh, I think I built something where I, it's really wild. I, 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 if you have you, all day and you have a home gym, you got to try it out. Do you it's think, really crazy. Do you think there's a little bit of a, a, a bias for us because we have so many years of experience in lifting that, you know, that's, and maybe if I was like a 20 year old with only a couple, maybe a year, let's say under my belt of lifting and um, I was following a similar protocol that I kind of do right now, which is like I said, this, you know, in to do an exercise out. And do you think that, because I've spent so much time under the iron, I've built so much muscle over the years that that's all it takes is a couple big gross motor movements and it kind of wakes up my entire CNS and my all my muscles and it's like, oh, we remember this and then it comes back on faster. I mean, that would be true with any routine, but I, I, you know, I'll make this argument. But I mean, that's I'm saying that because of that, I, I see even 
more value from that. And maybe when I'm 20, I'd be like, this isn't doing anything. You know what? I'll make this argument. Mm. Imagine <clears throat> all of us were training a, a kind of a relatively new 20 year old kid, maybe some athletic background, but no strength training. Now imagine doing an hour workout with them versus three 20 minute workouts spread out morning, afternoon, and evening, same volume, same everything. <clears throat> Do you think you would be able to get more out of the three 20 minute workouts or out of the one 60 minute workout? Yeah, the 320. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, that's how I feel too. I feel like fatigue because fatigue is a strength and muscle building killer. This is why yeah. when you that's why you rest between sets. That's why you. So I feel like you probably would get better results. Your performance would be way better. The only reason why nobody works out that way is it's extremely inconvenient. Nobody yeah. wants to work out three or four times. That's why I say take a day. You have a home gym. And then experiment. Take the day off and be like, I'm going to do this all day. And in between, I'll eat and watch TV. That's what I would do. Yeah. And uh, I did it a few times with Jessica, and it was it was crazy. You know, speaking of that, do you see the – I don't know who shared it. I saw it on social media. It's making its rounds right now. Uh, and, of course, it's how this, this is how this stupid game works. Um, you know, in the last, I would say, year or two, I mean, we were talking about cold immersion and, and cryotherapy – you know, when we first started this thing eight years ago. Uh, but it seems like it's become very popular in the last year to two years. And so, like, everybody's ice bathing now, right? Like, everybody yeah. is uh, in the fitness space. And then the only people that are not are the people that are taking the counter stance on it. And so there's now that wave of people yeah. that, that are trying to take a stance against it and either, one, minimize the value of it, or two, even trying to take a stance on how it's uh, impeding on recovery and stuff. Have you seen the? <clears throat> yeah, like there was this one yeah. Justin shared with me where this these, they were trying to say they were comparing active recovery to cold water immersion, which I think is an unfair comparison. Yeah, um, nothing, nothing is going to substitute, or nothing that we know of will substitute things like active recovery. Or like strength training, for example, uh, occlusion training or BFR, blood flow restrictive training. It builds muscle really lightweight. Will it replace traditional strength training? No. I think it's an interesting thing you can add to your current right, routine. Right. So I think cold water therapy, I don't use it for recovery. No. I don't think that's a good way to use it unless you're an athlete that's like at the limit and you're doing double days or yeah, you have to play again. Double days, going. exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. You're going to play in the morning, play again in the afternoon, yeah. and you, want to, you got to be able to perform again. That's different, but- for most people, cold water therapy, forget the recovery benefits. It's for immune boosting. It's to yes. help help regulate your central nervous system. It's for the energy boost. You're using it wrong, in my opinion, if you're doing it for the recovery. Oh, yeah. It, it reminded me a lot of like fasting and, yes. like, you know, and like how people are totally just using that for weight, weight loss. And yeah, it's the total wrong way to to really like put a lens on it because there's so many health benefits to cold water immersion, like for overall uh, health and immunity and, um, you know, just like a lot of, of other like holistic health benefit other than just like gaining muscle. And so like, if you're just like a, a bro that just wants to build muscle by all means necessary, those are really the ones that will pay attention to a study like that and then be like, oh, well, this is like completely worthless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's such a good analogy to compare it to the fasting thing, because I think both those things have become popular for the wrong reasons. Yep. Like fasting became popular for the weight loss benefits, but if you've listened to us talk about it for a long time, That's not it's, the benefits, it's the not fasting. the benefits at all. Same thing for the cold immersion. Cold immersion has become popular for its recovery, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. And like, athletes have used it in sports for so long, but that's never been the reason why we share and talk about it. And so it's funny that yeah. the, the, the angles that people will try and take to be, you know, counter are the wrong ones in my opinion. It's just like, well, I mean, I guess you can you can make that argument as far as it hindering recovery because I can I could, by the way too I could argue it the other way too. You could argue it both ways because you could argue that it may it may dampen the 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 recovery process by doing it right after, but if it also boosts your immunity, makes you feel better, mm -hmm. potentially helps you sleep later on that night, yeah. adds if those you're benefits. An overall healthier person, it, yeah, right. So and, I'll use an I'll use an analogy. Okay, so NSAIDs, right, non steroidal anti inflammatories yes. like ibuprofen, right. That blocks to an extent the inflammatory process. Obviously, they're anti inflammatories, but it blocks the infl the inflammatory process that leads to muscle growth. In other words, if you work out and then take a bunch of ibuprofen after, you're going to blunt somewhat the muscle building process. So then you got the meatheads were like, never take ibuprofen, whatever. Okay, well, what if you got a really bad headache and you're going to bed 
and you can't sleep. And you're like, forget it. I'm not taking ibuprofen, so I'm just not going to sleep. So I don't build muscle. And where do you recover the most? <laughs> sleep. Yeah, so yeah. so th- you got to weigh it out. That's right. And so then maybe taking it will help you sleep, which is going to outweigh the whatever potential you know, muscle building signal blunting effects of the NSAID, right? Dude. Nuance is just too hard, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, you know what? Ugh, if it can't these, fit in a cavemen tic- just if can't, can't handle fit in a nuance. TikTok video, get rid yeah. of it. <laughs> just, just, booga booga <laughs> muscle. <laughs> just fucking just idiots. Any dude. chance to make fun of the bodybuilding Jesus. community, you asshole? I'm just, I, I get, it's just cringe, dude. It's hard for me. I'm sorry. Hey, did I tell you guys, I don't know if I brought this up on a previous uh, podcast. Did I tell you guys about what I read this article about? Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Did I bring that up before? No. Did you about, talk about it? I no, don't know. It's been on so. there. But... Start it. Let me hear it. And I'll okay, tell you if I so, heard you say it yet. So you know how like most humans have some Neanderthal DNA? Yeah. So they'll test so there's some some regions of the world where they don't find any, but in in many parts, especially in Europe, when they'll test uh our DNA, they'll see that there's some Neanderthal DNA. So they know that um, you know, that our ancestors and Neanderthals, because they're they're do, yeah. two different they did the dirty. They're they're different species of uh, of uh, you know uh, Homo erectus or whatever, right? Of primates that they at some points mated, and then for some reason the Neanderthals went extinct. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of theories as to why the Neanderthals went extinct. First off, they thought, oh, well, we're so much smarter. But the reality is, there's lots of evidence that they were very complex. They were intelligent. They developed tools, so they were pretty smart themselves. So they're like, okay, well, um, like, what was it? Were we better hunters? Well, there's evidence that they were very successful hunters. They were quite strong, actually sturdier than than we were. So there's this new theory that I read. So when a male Neanderthal, because they look at the DNA, right? If a male Neanderthal mates with a female Homo sapien, that they can't have a baby. It doesn't work. Hmm. But if a male Homo sapien mates with a female Neanderthal, she can get pregnant. Uh. So they think what happened was Homo sapiens were taking over their tribes. They outbred just, them. Yeah. yeah. Just taking their chicks and just breeding. Uh. Them. Yeah. Outbred yeah. them. So basically we just made a bunch of. How do you, babies. how do you make peace with like <laughs> stacking theories on theories on <laughs> theories <laughs> to come to think? I mean, we just talked the other day. I, you know, as I'm talking, I'm looking at your face. Because you, like, you, you know, so you know, what, okay. And I'm, and, and let me make this clear. How do they the, know, Sal? I've read all these same things, yeah. Sal. So I mean, I just, it's we just, fun, dude. we just, just talk. I, that's the way to approach it. It's fun. It's fun to, to, <laughs> to try and take wild fucking guess and, and, and say maybe this, maybe that, but it's like, we it has just, something to do with the Y chromosome. I, we just actually, talked about, we just talked about DNA that we share with certain animals and d- digestive systems that are completely opposite of other. And it's like, we make these like, Oh, there's a, there's a fraction of this <laughs> DNA that we share with this. Therefore we probably fucked all of them and like out of competition. And then, then probably this happened and then that happened. Yeah. It's like, whoa, dude, like, yeah. where did we get all of that from? Because we have a, a, a tiny strand of DNA that we share with that. But then we, we totally it's don't the science version of like demons banging girls bro, back it, in the day. Seriously. You know, like, it's uh, the angels. people, you know, what's funny. This is a part of people. I mean, I grew up the, the, in a hardcore religious home. Right. So I, I understand, I understand the knock on, on that. Right. I, but this is the knock I have on scientism is that people adopt these ideas and theories and are so staunch about it because it's science-based. Yeah. And it's like, you're no different than the religious fanatic yeah. when you talk yeah. like that. Yeah, well, like, actually, that do you mean, not hear that? Yeah, no, I know when people well, get all like like, uh, like sure about it. Oh, that's, that's what happened. Like, well, we kind no, of, I know you're dude, not like that. came up so. with our idea. Yeah. Hilarious to me because it's not science because what we're doing is we're speculating, creating narratives for things that we weren't there to actually prove. And, and, and on that fact, like when they actually do prove the science, it's like, say it's like, um, um, what do you call that kind of science? It's geological kind of science. Like, so yeah. you get like Dr. Robert Schock, right? That goes to uh, the Sphinx and, and proves that there was water erosion. water erosion and it gets like acclaimed by all the rest of the geologic scientists. Like, and he gets an award and everything, but Egyptologists, but like historians, they all yeah. call him a quack in that like because they don't want to change the narrative that they've created already. and create these jobs well, with because they've already attached so many layers of theories yeah. on it and if you that's just, the human if condition. you interrupt that theory it's like oh fuck that unravels well, all these other yeah, ones just, well yeah you know how long ago Egypt was had that, had water like that hmm. way before the Egyptians so then if that's water I think erosion, that's like the 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 oldest thing 
the Sphinx. Yeah. They think that's like the oldest thing uh, visibly, like a, a no, stash that we have. Yeah. So no, so basically, if that's water erosion and it's true, then the Sphinx existed there before the Egyptians. Yes. Did anything? Maybe they found it, and that's why they built exactly. Their civilization. And then they built their civilization around yeah. it. Look at Adam right now. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then probably why they worshipped them as gods. And yeah. Stuff like that, the well, go back to Tepe. Fucked up everything for them too, because it's like it, it. It just predates everything they had even before that. So yeah, it's like, yeah. what do you? How do you reconcile? I, with I that? mean, I think my th my point of like even challenging or saying or questioning any of that is not that like I'm not like necessarily arguing or debating that that's not potentially true it's just that you know it's so interesting to me i find it interesting the, you know, especially in the science community obviously i'm in a lot of that right so i see and hear and it's and coming from somebody who was from a very religious background i see so many parallels yeah and it's and it, it, the irony is how how staunch each of them are yeah. about each other, and it's just like how how much alike because it's you a really reflection of, of your own behaviors. Yes, you, you don't like your bad behaviors, so and you two, project that on other people. Two things: Have you ever seen the meme that someone made that said, "If scientists used bones of common animals and put them together the way that we did with dinosaurs, this is what we think they would look like." You ever seen that? Mm -mm. So they'll take like elephant bones or like a bird. And because we don't know what dinosaurs look like, we guess yeah. what they look. Could have been covered in feathers and colorful. Oh, wow. Hilarious. That's, so you'll see that's like great. Like animals you know of. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's, so that's. Uh, them like they, recreating what they look like. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. hilarious. So, okay. So. I've heard of that before too. Here's, uh, here's uh, just to back up kind of what you're saying, Adam. So obviously our, ex the, you know, field of expertise is health and fitness. You, the science space, when it comes to nutrition has been off so many times, and yet they were so sure that they were right. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Now, we now have a food pyramid. Did you guys see this? Thank but, you for bringing this up. They, this is absurd. They are, they created an algorithm or they created a way to rank foods in terms of healthiness, quote unquote healthiness. And according to the way that they rank foods, Fruit Loops is healthier than steak, okay, or eggs. So immediately- Way healthier. Throw it out. Okay, so- I, I shared with you guys already, if you haven't looked at it, um, I haven't read the full article, so I don't have a very strong position either way on this, but there's a doctor who I don't like, actually. He's annoying. Yeah, he is very annoying. Um, but we he- give him a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be our shout out for today. Yeah, yeah. I just don't, I just, I, I, whether he thinks he's helping or not, I, don't, I mean, not first of know. all, if you wear a lab coat and stethoscope on TikTok videos- you automatically should get slapped, in my opinion. Just, I, don't <laughs> hey, we should do I don't give a fuck how smart you are. If you have to wear a lab coat and a stethoscope in your TikTok videos, can we, you should get can slapped. Can we do videos with a, with, a, with like a stopwatch hanging around our neck and a dumbbell yeah. on our shoulder? It would be like me, it would be like me <laughs> holding my bodybuilding trophy yeah. while I'm talking all the time. <laughs> like, so this is how you carb cycle, you know what I'm saying? Just hold it, you know what I'm saying? Like cradle it every time I talk on the podcast. Like, what are you doing, Adam? Like, nothing. This is just, I conveniently hold this wherever I, yeah, this wherever is I go. weird. This is yeah. how I hang out, make videos. No, so he, what he, in his <laughs> That's defense. That's probably his Tinder profile. Yeah. He's got, he's got a stethoscope. Yeah, 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 for sure it is. For sure it is. Yeah. So now that I'm done punking him, let me give him his flowers. I he did go in there and explain that it's being this Joe Rogan and everybody's yeah. taking it out of context because when you actually go in and read the actual paper, what people are it's uh they 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 took it category by category. So it's not literally steak is technically healthier than it's the It's got a better rating. This in that category. Sure. So in and, and that's what it and so there's so it's just saturated fat is the category for that just, is they, that what it they is create no. their, they create their their standards watch the watch the video I sent over to you unless Doug could pull Listen, it up and we can watch it together is, food is very complex however this is actually quite simple hmm. okay I'm gonna say it right here and right now here's your food pyramid whole natural foods processed foods that's it if you if you avoid processed foods and you eat Pretty much almost all of your food comes from whole natural sources. You will solve 90% of your dietary problems. That is it right there. Why? You don't overeat. You're going to eat nutrient-dense type foods. They're, they produce more satiety. It's just, and it's very simple. That's it right there. Whole natural foods, processed foods. If you avoid those, you're fine. 
these food pyramids that they make are so silly where they yeah. put well we know we know that that will never be a popular because the amount of money oh that my god is, it's all uh, in processed foods yeah i mean when you when you look at like people like lobbyists and so like that i mean you oh, got, you got to think like pharmaceutical number one and then what i would think that processed foods has got to be up there in the top three or five just look at your right? kids cafeteria yeah kind of i mean food they're, they serve they're, they're not gonna let good and so and i think you brought that point up justin so let's play the other side that you know everybody is misinterpreting this article at the end of the day if it can be misinterpreted that easy from a bunch it's of it's the institutions now that that go off of these standards and so my my buck to the system is always like where that ends up and that ends up in our kids that ends up in our education system it ends up like it is just all misinformation and it just leads people astray confused yeah, yeah. everybody confused yeah, yeah. all right i want to give a shout out so people watching right now on youtube are probably wondering why we slowly started to look like werewolves and why now <laughs> we look we look good again. Like we yeah. took a shower. Teen Wolf. Yeah, it's because uh, we have so Miss Vicky, Vicky for one week. Vicky, she owns Faded Barbershop uh, in San Jose and Morgan Hill. She's exceptional with what best she fades does. ever. She yeah, uh, she hooks us up, makes us look uh, not like <laughs> like homeless werewolves, um, and so that's why we look good. But that's who I want to give a shout out on Instagram at uh, Faded Barbershop. I want to give her a shout out because she's I think really you good. I think her shout out should come with a asterisk or like a uh, well, no, no. Be, that, buyer be follower beware. Is her barbershop that she posted? Oh, you do it on the barbershop, yeah. not her personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the barbershop. Because yeah. she goes, she goes kind of hard, bro. She goes kind of hard on the, on the Instagram, dude. Well, if you got I think she's been shadow banned at least four or five times. Yeah. And so Vicky, Vicky, Vicky gave her last fuck a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah. That's why we love her though, for yeah. sure. Yes. And when you guys go in the shop, and she's so the she, sweetest person too. She so gets this yeah. a lot when people come to the shop and she doesn't know till way later that they are, they came from mind pump. So make sure you say yeah, hi to sure her. Or something say, like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Say, say what's up to her and say, you listen to mind pump. Hey, check this out. There's a company we work with called paleo Valley. They make paleo inspired supplements. One of my favorites is their bone broth protein. They have a chocolate flavored bone broth protein that I swear to God tastes like chocolate donuts. It's the best tasting, literally the best tasting protein powder I've ever had. And because it's bone broth, it's super easy to digest. Like I could take high doses of this protein and have zero gut issues, total no gut issues whatsoever with it. So anyway, go check this company out. Check out their products. Go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mind pump 15 for 15% off your order. All right, here comes the show. Our first caller is Jordan from California. Jordan, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys. It's super cool to meet you. Uh, big fan. Listen for like just about a year now. Oh, um, right. Yeah, my buddies are going to be jealous. I got to meet uh, Tiny Beard and the gang, so pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, for real though, you guys have been great. Like I've only been working out for about a year though, but found you guys pretty early on. So it's been huge help. And I feel like I've kind of missed a lot of the uh, ways you could go wrong when starting out. So big thank you to you guys. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, man. Yep. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. So like I said, I started working out. It's almost, it'll almost be a year. Febru middle of February would be a year. Um, I, when I started, I was a 165 and I'm 6'2. So pretty, pretty skinny. And then I did a bulk to 196. And then finished that because that was about as big as I wanted to be at that point. And then I was going to lean out. So I started to cut about three months ago and I've lost. I'm right. Well, right now I'm 184 and I've been losing about a pound a week. <clears throat> which I've heard is pretty, is like kind of the benchmark or whatnot. But uh, I don't feel like I've been any leaner. Like I'm just losing weight, but not seeing any, getting uh, any more lean. Uh, so I just wondering what I'm doing wrong. This is such a classic. Um, do you remember we talked about that? We've talked yeah. about this before. Uh, I don't know if we've talked on the show or not or, as much, but uh, it's such a, a, a mind fuck when you shift from, you know, bulking to leaning out and that first, you know, even couple <laughs> months, like, you just feel smaller. You do. Yeah. You and let me explain what's going on, right? So you come on you you you're on a high calorie diet right before this. So you your your glycogen levels are your stores are filled out. So your muscle bellies are filled out. You got all these extra calories. That means your body's holding on to more water. You've got more carbohydrates in you and so you you're filled out. And then you make this transition like, "Okay, I'm going to go on this cut." 
And the first thing that really goes is all that glycogen and water. And so that gets pulled out. And, it, and what it actually makes you look like is it looks like you lost muscle size. And so it's it's a bit of this mind fuck of like, oh my God, I'm not, and you don't see your abs popping anymore. What you see is like your arms look smaller, your legs look smaller. And so you think, oh my God, this sucks. Like I go on this cut. And by the way, this is super common for lean guys who want to build muscle. They go on the bulk and they go on the cut. And it's the reason why a lot of them can't stick with the cut. And and this was me for a decade Same. plus. Yep. Is I'd go on a cut for a minute, just like you're right right now, and then I'd be like, "Fuck this! Yeah. Like I'm I'm not getting any leaner. I'm just getting smaller. Tiny. I'd rather be a little fatter with more muscle." And so you go back the other direction. It's part of the process, and it is and let me tell you, it's one of the for me, it was one of the most difficult things. I had the discipline to stay consistent with the eating and the training. It was the psychological part of it would it would fuck with my insecurity of being the small guy. But trust the process. You just gotta stick it. You gotta stay the course, and then you'll start to see as as the weeks go on, you will start to drop body fat. You will, and you will lean out, and you will go through a little period of feeling like the small guy again because you've got that in your head because you probably were a skinnier guy trying to build and and build muscle. But it's very very common what you're going through right now. So I have a question. You you went you gained about thirty pounds when you did your bulk originally. This was over mm -hmm. what, the course of a year. No. So that was, so like when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I just had a workout plan from a friend of a friend and it was like just a normal bro split. Right. So I went, did that for like two weeks and I was like, Oh, I just had like a feeling I was doing something wrong. And then I just kind of like stumbled on you guys. And I was like, Oh, I need to be eating more and I need to be probably doing full body. So I got anabolic, but I didn't start actually eating for, on a bulk until like a month. So it's been probably like, I did a bulk for about seven months, I would say. Okay, so 30, eight, pound, 30 pounds in seven to eight months. Uh, did you, it's any, incredible. Any, <laughs> any body fat testing during this period of time? Do you know how much no. lean body mass it is? No, I, I wish I did, but I didn't even know about that before. Like, I was total total new. Like, okay. never done anything before. Okay, so that's a lot in a, in a short period of time. So it's likely you gain muscle and body fat, um, unless mm -hmm. you have, like, this really amazing – Muscle building genetics. I would guess out of that thirty pounds, it's probably half and half. Yeah. So you know, fifteen muscle, fifteen pounds uh, of body fat. Um, when you're trying to cut and you're trying to go down, it's important to do body fat testing because of the mind games it could play with you. The, one of the questions I have is during this cut, are you weaker, or if you are, how much weaker are you in the gym? No, not and nothing has changed really. Okay. My That's squat, a my squat has gone down like like 10 pounds from normally I'm in um, aesthetic right now, but I just finished the last one I finished was a uh, uh, symmetry. Okay. So that's so a I, good, that's a good sign. Yeah. If your strength yeah. is, isn't, hasn't really gone down much, especially uh, coming from that much weight. Dude. Yeah. And you lost 11 pounds. You're, yeah. you're, you're moving in the right direction. One pound a week strength is maintaining somewhat for the most part. I, um, I, I think you're doing all right. I literally think this is a psychological thing. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's you got to so, stick to the cut. Cause yeah. for me, the first, when I would do these big bulks and I would cut the first three to 4% body fat, I couldn't even tell. It just felt like I was getting smaller. Yeah. It wasn't smaller until I got and to, weaker. That's and weaker. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't until I got to like 11% that I could be like, Oh, I can see what's going on. Once I get to 10%, then I'd be motivated by the definition that I would see in the gym. But until I got there, it was like, I'm just going to wear sweaters and t-shirts. Cause I, 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 cause the way I would yeah. feel, would be like I'm wasting my time. And so I never really did a, a, an effective cut for a long time. I'd never really pushed it to see how lean, lean I could get until I was you know, much older. You know that's you know that's what a lot of the the body like a lot of us that like competed, this is actually part of the strategy. You and you might if you know anybody that has this will will go in all hoodied out like that. Yeah. And part of that is at least for me, this was the psychology of that is like I don't even want to. I don't even want to get distracted by the way I look because right. I know my own insecurities of being a small guy. And if I'm looking in the mirror and I'm comparing myself this week in this cut right. to what I was looking like, like just say four weeks ago when I was in the bulk, I know I liked the bigger, thicker version of me because I was the skinny guy who always wanted to be. Yeah. But I, but I know I need to lean out. So I just, so I would cover up in a hoodie and stay that way. And so I don't even look at my look at myself while I'm training. I just focus on the training, focus on the diet, focus on the training. And then when I mm -hmm. like Sal's point, then you get to a point where you start to get really leaner than you've ever been. Like when you start to hit 
levels of leanness that you've never seen on yourself, then it's re-motivating to peel down to the t-shirt again and yeah. see like see the vascularity. Then people think you got bigger. Yeah, and then that that's the part that will trip you out if you if you stay the course, stick with the process, get as get leaner than you've ever been in your life. And then watch the people come to you and go like, bro, you got huge. Oh my God, what did you do? It's a trip because, and you're going to go like, what? I was 196 and now I'm like yeah. 175. And you guys are saying I'm bigger. Like I'm not bigger, but you you will look bigger because you've 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 leaned out. I mean, this has always been a deterrent for me to cut. And I remember you having to walk me through that uh, you know process and talking about like being flat and then yep, also yep. being filled up and that whole thing. And I was like completely oblivious being from the performance end of things. So it's totally a psychological game. Yeah, I, I think you're probably going to end up around 175 to 178 with a, with a nice mm. lean physique. That's probably where you're going to end up if I had to guess. Because you haven't tested your body fat, this is a guess. <laughs> but you're, I, 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 would, I would put money on, on around 175, 178, with like you know decent definition where you could you could see visible abs. Okay, that's so I'm not too far off. Hopefully, I'll be just a little bit longer. Yeah, I that. Sorry, that but that's what I was worried about because I didn't know like if there was a point of when you've been in a cut for too long. Like if there's a spot when you should just say like I'm doing something wrong. Like I shouldn't. My body shouldn't be in a cut for this long. Or if that was just something I was making up. If if you if you're continuing to lean out and and maintain strength for the most part because it's actually very normal to lose strength so don't yeah. even trip out if you lose a little bit of strength yeah that's from law like less glycogen less energy yeah less so energy. it's very common to lose some strength so if you if you if you lose just a little bit of strength and you're continuing to lean out i would i would push it until i'm all the way as lean as i want to yeah. get right so if you start to feel really weak tired um overtrained achy then you could do like a mini bulk kind of rejuvenate yourself mm -hmm. watch your intensity of your workouts yeah, even like a week, a week of just a That's surplus it. is mm -hmm. enough to and then go right back to the cut. So sometimes I'll do that. Like let's say you've been in a cut for a while, and even if, even if you're just tired of eating that way and you miss a good workout of feeling filled, like throw in a week where you're like in a surplus of calories, and you should shoot back and then go right back to the cut again. You can do that too. Yeah. But I, literally, what you the what you're describing to me, I can relate so much to as far as it's it's a psychological game. And when I think back to my journey of competing, that was the hardest part about competing. Not my program design, not following the meal. It was the, the, the mental game of being a guy who his whole life identified as the skinny kid who was who wanted to be big. I finally got kind of thick and big, and now here I am cutting it all away. It, it, it was a mind fuck. And so trust the process. You'll be very happy. If you if you stick it with it and don't let your mind play those games, yeah. The, the next ten pounds you lose if you do it right is going to be th this will be the fun ten pounds in terms of what you look at what you see in the mirror. That first ten pounds you just feel smaller. Yeah. Next the next the next ten you're going to start to see the definition in the mirror and it'll feel a little different. Yeah, it'd be more motivating. Awesome. Yeah, Adam, what you said that's like ex exactly how I'm feeling right now. Like whatever you. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. same. Yeah. Nope, totally, totally can relate, bro. You're doing good. Stick, you're you're doing actually you're doing killer when you think about how much you yeah. put on. So you're kicking ass, bro. Yeah, yeah. Test your body fat though too, because that'll that'll give you more of an accurate gauge. Yeah. Yeah, I just ordered a body fat caliper, but I wish I did at the beginning. But I had one super quick little follow up. Sure. It's for mostly for Justin. Um, I'm looking at doing performance next, but I'm worried about not having the. Cause I know you said something about May spells and some like other different types of training, but that my gym doesn't have like anything real like fancy. I don't know if, what equipment I would need. Oh to yeah. Make sure I can May do spells it all. Aren't, yeah. They're not included in, in maps performance. That's something like in, in terms of like incorporating stuff like that in Indian clubs, you know, for the mobility sessions, I think that's cool. And it's a great idea. Uh, but really what you, all you need is, um, squat rack barbells dumbbells the only thing uh that's a little bit different you, you need a landmine kind of setup and if you don't you can kind of you know makeshift one like put it barbell in the corner and kind of go in that direction but uh you know it's recommended that you get like a landmine for that that's yeah. the only thing right yeah, yeah it's it's, the only it's, thing, really. yeah performance was designed for the typical gym yeah oh okay yeah, perfect you, yeah you should be good yep all right man thanks for calling all out, right brother. keep us posted yeah, thank you guys you got Thank it. you guys so much. All right, man. No All right, brother. You, oh, you know what? I you know what I should have said is, 
You know what's really beneficial for the mind games that happen with a cut with somebody who doesn't like to feel smaller? Carb cycling. Carb cycling helps a lot because it'll give you days of hot, you know, more glycogen, more water in your muscles. And then you'll look in the mirror and you'll feel pumped up and you'll be like, okay, I, you know, I think I'm moving in the right direction. Do you remember what I told you that what I used to do with this? So I used to, uh, so I I've admittedly on the show, I talk about how I'm, I'm so inconsistent with supplements. I really am. There's it's, I'm just not good at like consistently taking supplements. Plus, I know like how how small of a difference it makes to take the supplements. I focus. I tend to focus on the food diet, all of the things mm -hmm. that are in the training. That's way more important, mm -hmm. right? So the most consistent I ever was with creatine was during this time. So I used creatine in and like cut. and water loading in a cut yeah. for the psychological reason. Yeah. So because and and I think because I don't consistently use it. Using it during the cut, I thought it'll and, offset some of those water. And then, and then I also started to make it a goal to pound like a half a gallon mm, before I yeah. went into my workout, and so it would give me this fuller look, and that really helped me get through this kind of phase that he's at right now because it it's crazy how it's it's, it's this is just like when you take somebody who's always been overweight and right, you have right. them do a bulk and they <laughs> right. and they fill out a little bit and then they feel like oh my god i'm going the wrong direction yeah i'm getting that yeah it's it no definitely difference. a deterrent for me oh to address to the last question i forgot to mention also kettlebells are recommended highly you can get away with dumbbells but definitely a good one next caller is james from arizona james what's happening hey guys how's it going what's, what's up good, man Hey, so first off, like everybody else, I have to say thanks for everything you guys do and all the honest, good quality content you guys put out there. Um, made a huge impact in my life personally. Because of you guys, I switched up everything in school and I'm a dietetic student now trying to be a dietitian. Sweet. And I'm actually in the level one cohort with NCI. Hell yeah. Um, so we actually talked, Sal and I talked at the end of 2022 on that last coach's call. And I asked you like a similar question about wildland firefighters. It was more about business, but this is more about exercise. So Okay. Yeah, so a little bit of background on me. I am a dog musher in Alaska in the wintertime and then a wildland firefighter in Arizona in the summertime. Um, so for me, as far as like seasons of life go, we're kind of coming up on the preseason of fire. So the season starts to peak up and ramp up in May. Um, but between now and then, it's like February, March, and April. This is kind of like the preseason time. So my big question to you guys was, what is the best way to program for wildland firefighters between now and then? So we got about three months. Did we did we cover this in the episode where we did um, first responder? Yeah, one? first responder. Similar. We did, similar. didn't we? Yeah, did we? somewhat similar. We did an episode on this and kind of talked about the considerations for workouts. You know, uh, because we're talking to you and we're not speaking generally, um, I'm going to need a little bit more information. So- for you, what are areas of your fitness that you think you um, can improve upon in relation to this? In other words, when you're out there fighting fires and dog mushing, where what where do you feel you're yeah. weak? Do you stamina, feel strength, stability? Do you get injured? Like, what are the things you need to focus on? Yeah, so I do remember the episode you guys are talking about, and I do remember that for first responders specifically, you guys recommended strong. Um, for us and for me, like I'm programming for other guys too, okay. because I've been doing it for a few seasons. So they kind of let that, let me do that with NCI. I kind of got some of the nutrition stuff down. Um, but where we see guys lacking that come in, like the new guys, it's really just on like the, the stamina of like, we could take anywhere from, you know, 25 to 50,000 steps in a day, um, depending on the fire. And that could go on for two weeks straight, um, every single day. Okay. So a lot of the times it's just getting the guys having the, the, the ability to take that many steps with that amount of weight, anywhere from like 45 to 60 pounds and stuff. So usually we see guys coming in and they're lacking in those areas. It's so usually the hiking areas. Yeah. All right. So well, a lot like work capacity. Yeah. yeah. That's strong for yeah, sure. Well, okay. So generally speaking, um, what you would do is you would have your, your off season, then preseason, then in season. Okay. So like with any athlete off right. season, you typically are trying to build a really strong base and foundation. This is where you're looking to maximize strength, maximize mobility, maximize performance, okay? But strength is a big one here. So it's like, let's get strong. Let's get really strong. Preseason, we're now moving more, we're moving closer towards what the work is going to look like. So you're probably in this point going to back off on the strength focus and focus more on stamina and endurance. And then in season is all about recovery and injury prevention. So when you go mm -hmm. off season, it's in the gym, it's heavy. You're doing some stuff that's similar to what you do in season, 
but really you're trying to just get stronger, okay? When you're preseason, then your training looks a lot like what, what your work. So you're training and practicing with a, a ru- you know, you're rucking if that's very similar to what your 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 work looks like. You're training for stamina. You may be doing things like circuits. You're basically trying to get your fitness capacity to match what's going to be required. Then when you're in when you're actually in the season, it's mobility, it's recovery, it's active recovery, and you're not trying to improve anything. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they try to get more fit uh, with their workouts in season. What they need to do is try to maximize recovery, repair, and injury prevention. That'll keep your performance uh, higher um, than trying to improve your performance. I know it sounds kind of weird, but that's exactly what happens uh, that way. So that's generally speaking. Now, what can make up those workouts? Well, a lot of things. You know, off-season strength, you know, power lift, anabolic, um, split might even kind of fall strong is good in there. You know, when you're preseason, now you're looking more like, performance yeah. or cardio or something like that. Then when you're you're actually in season, now it's like prime pro, you know, it's mobility, it's it's active recovery type of stuff. So I like strong leading up. I like where he's at right now in preseason cardio and actually all the places that we have recommended to do cardio, I would pick specific things to what he's training for. So so for example, in cardio we program the, the weight training to complement all this endurance training and the endurance training, we give people kind of this flexibility. Do you want to row one day? Do you want to run? And like, so I would literally take that programming and I think the, the amount of volume around the, the, the weights is perfect for where you're currently at. And then I would modify all the cardio to more specific things that you think will carry over to your everyday life. It's like back to Sal's point, throwing on a backpack, a 50 pound backpack and doing, you know, stairs for, you know, a half hour, hour, I'd be doing things like that, that we're going to emulate the closest thing that I'm going to get out there and do in yeah. real world. Um, and then I, like I said, I like, str- yeah. I like strong before and I like that performance. I can see the, and I know Justin will probably go that yeah. way because of the rotational mobility stuff that's involved in there. I definitely would for sure pull yeah. mobility stuff well, in season from, from performance. Also right? because it's a, a seasonal buildup. Um, I think that because off season, it was a real big structure to maps performance. I, I could make an argument for what Adam's saying in terms of like starting cardio or even starting performance, then cardio, then uh, map strong. Uh, so I think map strong is like the pinnacle of kind of where you want to be in terms of overall volume and work capacity. Uh, okay. So to build and establish that fun, like foundational strength first, this is my argument for mass performance first, you know, going through that specifically laid out like phase one is very much of a building foundational strength. You know, you get that multiplanar movement established, you get that uh, endurance, like a, a speed power, and then we get into power. Uh, and then that kind of leads naturally into then focusing directly on cardiovascular, which is, you know, sounds like that's like a big priority for everybody coming in. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I think the thing you want to consider the most is that um, what you don't want to do, the closer you get to the season, is do Overtrain. most of your training in the gym. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I don't need to tell you this, but for other people listening, there's a lot of skill involved in the activities that you do as a firefighter out in the wild. And I don't mean just the the the, the skill with you know handling, you know putting out fires and stuff, but there's a lot of skill involved with hiking through the mountains and moving through brush and you know you know all that other stuff, and you can't you can't perfectly mimic that in the gym. You'll get some carryover, but you can be fit as hell in the gym. You go out and in, into the in the mountains and try and fight fires, and you're going to beat yourself up because you don't know how to move uh, properly. So what you don't want to do, and this is a big mistake a lot of people make, is they do all their workouts in the gym. When what they need to do as they get closer to season is is go out and do what the season's going to look like. So that's one of the biggest things to consider. And then again, I'm going to make this point again. If you took two groups of people and one group in season was trying to improve performance, the other group was just trying to prevent injury and facilitate recovery, the group that facilitated recovery and prevented injury is going to perform better. I know that sounds kind of funny, but they're going to end up with less less injuries. They're going to last longer. And their performance will actually be better. So consider that as well. What, let's uh, a couple. James, how many? What programs do you have of the ones we we listed? I have 
strong and i mean i have pretty much everything except cardio okay so let's 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 send you cardio over and then i know we threw all kinds of shit at you right there but i think the original like simple advice that sal was giving about like what preseason, what in season and then what off season looks like and because you have a background in this and you have knowledge around it you literally could take those 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 programs performance strong and cardio uh and kind of mold you know, more specific to you and your guys. Right. Um, I do have one more question though. I've been meaning to ask one of my firefighter buddies, what is it called? What's the, um, is it like a competition you guys do? I see every once in a while, like, and then you see them sometimes go viral videos of the like firefighters. Where that, they run up the Yes. Where they of, run up, uh, the, where they run up the ladder, ladders hella yeah. fast. Like, is there a name? Yeah. Yeah. So that's not, so there's a big difference between like structure firefighters and wildland firefighters. Yeah. Okay. So that's more on the structure side. So structure dudes, like they're the guys you see in town. Um, like fire medical guys, wildland dudes are the guys with like the, you know, the green trucks and the yellow shirts and stuff like that. And you rarely ever see us because we're in the woods and stuff. Got it. Yeah. You guys, like, we don't usually use, like, we don't use, like, I, I can't tell you when the last time I used a ladder, you know, we use, use a fire spikes. water. So. You, you guys are like spikes, right? You guys are uh, put the spikes they, on, yeah, on the trees. Yeah. So like uh, you guys, would probably, you guys are probably seeing around up in Truckee. Um, California gets real busy. Like the season can go. That's just in Arizona. The season's like May until when monsoons hit in like July, maybe early August. But after that, we'll get assigned over in, you know, Montana or California. And California usually is like October to as late as December, like in 2020. Um, like it, it, it gets real busy. But so you guys have probably seen us around. Um, but yeah, that, that ladder stuff is more the, the structure guys. So we, we can spend the assignments look like 16 hours a day for two weeks straight. So you do the 16 hours a day, but you're working the entire time when you're away from home the two weeks straight. And then you come home for two mandatory paid days off. And then you go back out again for two weeks. And you could do that really for the entire season. Like we, wow. I've gone Damn. 72 days straight getting paid before. Wow. Holy like it's, Toledo. It's, Maniac. You know, you're, you're constantly gone and moving around and stuff. So yeah. wow. Yeah. It's a lot for the yeah. recovery facilitating recovery and preventing injury is going to be by, I wouldn't do any additional workouts, honestly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like so that. I didn't ask you about the in season specifically because I figured you guys would, I figured you, like, I've been listening to you guys for a couple of years and you would agree. All I had written down for the in season essentially was doing pulling like two, maybe two mobility sessions from performance a week and then doing four like prime, prime pro sessions and stuff like that with the guys and just doing that six That's times it. a week. I and, love that, bro. And sleep. Yeah. And focusing on, on optimizing uh, sleep will be really, yeah. You guys probably know how to use chainsaws and, and axes and, Stuff like that really well because so. yeah. you have to, right? Yeah. What does yeah. a dog musher do, by the way? I mean, I know what that looks like, but w- oh. what is that as a job? Are you traveling? Are you taking um, yeah, people so from place to right place? Now, I go up to Alaska from, like, I'm going up February and March, um, and I run Sprint Dogs. So most people know about the Iditarod, which is, like, the long-distance race. It's a 1,000 miles. Um, and that one is, like, eight. It, they do it in 8 to 10 days. So the dogs are running over hundred miles every day. Um, and they're, wow. so they're VO2 max. I run sprint dogs, which do 18 to 27 ish miles a day, three to seven days in a row. And their VO2 max is 240 to 300. <laughs> like they're ridiculously <laughs> fit and they're, and they like have no, they recover super quickly and they're just incredible athletes. So those are the guys, those are the dogs that I run and we run. So cool. I'm just an amateur dude. So I run like four to six dogs, but you'll have folks running 18 to 22 dogs. Wow. And, and what is, what are you doing? Are you, are you delivering mail or medical supplies? Like what's the work? Uh, some folks do that. Like some folks still use them in the villages. So like most of Alaska, you can't get to by the highway system. So they still use sled dogs and stuff to, you know, deliver mail or, or medical supplies and stuff like that. But most of us race. So we have um, like races throughout January to April. And we just go around the state and we just um, like ours look from well, like we have one coming up that's I want to say it's three days and it's for my class specifically, it's like four miles the first two days and six miles the last day. And they time it. They're just racing. So, so it's it's, it's purely sport for you then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And it's easier for me because I don't have as many dogs. So it's easier for me to just be flexible and like fly around and do things I want so I can have the, the seasons because I also climb and stuff, too. Um, and I'm learning how to ice climb. So like doing all that stuff, it's like, it's just, it's a lot better with a small group of dogs. What's, what's that thing? He's missing like Alex, right? Uh, 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 the, uh, the, the rock climber guy who know, needs, uh, needs like crazy adrenaline. Yeah. Just to- <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. But there's, well, if you look up, uh, so the ice climbing, there's a, I'm sure you've seen it, but the alpinist on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's crazy. That guy's insane. Like he, uh, or he was insane. Yeah. But he, um, like that guy, he, Alex Honnold in there. 
calls that guy crazy because yeah. he's like out soloing these crazy mountain peaks and stuff like that. But it's like, I don't plan on doing that. Like that movie doesn't make me want to go free solo stuff, but the <laughs> lifestyle is really cool. Yeah. So with NCI, like those are the clients that I really am stoked to work with are the dudes that live a regular lifestyles like me. Oh, cool. It's like one of the guys I'm working with is an Olympic level speed climber. You know, so like, it's just, uh, those are the clients that I'm, I'm super stoked to work with. Well, yeah. James, hey, James, are you, awesome. are you in our forum? Uh, no, I'm not. You I'm are a, now. Yeah. We're going to put you in the forum. You, you're, you'd be a great person to be in there too. Because Hell yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. So I, I can't wait to hear how everything goes for you, man. Stay yeah. in touch with us. All right. Thanks for calling in. Yeah. Thanks guys. If you ever find yourself in Alaska, feel free to come up and take a dog tour. We will. Sure I we will. will. I, yeah. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, yeah. Justin, the only just, one to take you. Justin and I would do, I would do right that. On. Fuck off. Yeah, yeah, here, bro. Bro. You wouldn't do that. Yes. You would not go in the middle of the snow in the middle of the wilderness. Yes, it and would. Just dogs. He's riding the, he's driving the dogs. I just have my coat and got to hold onto his waist. You know You're like having 12 Olympic athletes pull you around. They'll get you back home. Just Dude, Adam, the, Adam doesn't want to go camping. As long as you park just get him a nice As long as you get me inside. As long as you get me to my nice ass cabin, I'm with my fire and, and my my. <laughs> my yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we have a lodge on the property and everything. There we go. There we yeah. go. I'm All good, bro. Right. We'll thanks. See man. you out there. See you, James. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it, bro. How? What, when was the last time we got out manly so hard? Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that's just, bro. You know this. I hey, do that. I do that. Hey, homeboy. I'll chill. Works. About it you know 72 days straight and then it w in his off season or his yeah. his vacationing is in alaska on yeah. sled dogs <laughs> sled dogging i love it dude uh, true uh, outdoorsman oh, 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 well, there's a definition of like alpha uh, too much. <laughs> do you guys remember when you figured that out with athletes though did you have to figure that out with yourself with your own training first or because i figured i that took me a long time because i would continuously train athletes and myself like I'm trying to improve performance in season. And just oh, yeah, yeah. You're trying to improve problems. in season? Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, that's a very common thing. Coaches like get in that conundrum. It's like, you know, kid, they're getting all this like great performance. How can we maximize? And yeah. it's like you got to realize that just you're keeping it. Yeah, yeah. Keeping it intact is everything. I actually think this is, um, you know, credit Joe DeFranco. I think Joe was the, the person who I probably started to find around around this time in my life when I was starting to figure out the, mm -hmm. the like good protocol for athletes because there really wasn't a lot out there. No. no. There wasn't a lot of good information. Void. Yeah. Very, it was very bodybuilding training. Very, very much so. I mean, that's the reason why too I always I always talk and pump the tires of um or uh, Paul Fabritz because it just it didn't exist. There's just not a lot of it. Even today, there's, I mean, it's I, a lot thinner than I would have thought. You no, know, yeah. It's, even in this internet world, there's there's a um, there's a handful of really good sports performance coaches that are online that I feel that are accessible, like those guys. Our next caller is EJ from Illinois. EJ, how you doing? By the way, I think we might have the wrong question up there, Doug. Are you you're EJ and you're almost fifty two years old? Is that correct? Yes. Wow. What in the oh, hell are you. you doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's some good genes, probably, and um, good living. Not perfect, not perfect. No injections, but um, trying, just trying. You know, just doing the best I can. Okay, well, you're, you're winning. I never met anybody who looked twenty years you. younger than me. So, <laughs> all right. So, what's your you're question? Right. Yeah. Now that we're done flirting, what's your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of doing this on behalf of so many people like me that I'm working with right now. So like you said, I'm almost 52. Um, I'm metabolically healthy. I weigh about 114, 115, five foot two. Um, I am a health coach, so I kind of do things fairly right. I did lose a lot of my fitness level though from about 46 to 51 because I felt so fragile. Um, perimenopause just like ate me alive. And in that time, I just couldn't do what I used to do. And I had to kind of get used to a new version of myself. Um, I've been slowly building back my fitness in the last year. And I do feel somewhat better. But my sleep is still elusive. And um, I do all that crap right, too. And it's still tough just with perimenopause and hormones. Um, that said, my recovery always stinks as well because of my sleep situation. Um, and I actually am one of those people that works out like I like myself, not like I'm punishing myself. I started with MAPS um, performance, and I really like the mobility part of it, but shifted into MAPS 15 advanced because my kids keep me busy and I just needed to compress the time. Um, I do do other mobility work, too. But my question is pretty simple. At my age and for women like me who can't even work out around their cycles because we don't know when the hell they are at this rate, um, can we really build muscle 
what is possible for me at this stage. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, so it, so if I'm talking to a woman who's 52, who just started working out, you know, recently or within the last couple of years, the potential to build muscle is, is huge. Now, I'm an yeah, I'm, unchanged muscle, right? Like yeah. I've been working out since I was 25 yeah. and I was super fit and not anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, I'm going to disagree with you because yeah, you yeah. look super, well, you're the most fit looking 52 year old I've ever met, but, <laughs> it, but because you've been working out for so long, um, you're going to be working a lot with things like muscle memory. Now you, you might be able to go to gain some of the muscle back that you might've lost. It sounds like you said you might've lost some muscle, but to, 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 perform and build beyond what you've done in the past might be kind of tough because you've been doing this for so long. Yeah. And and this is tough, EJ, because I find myself in this position as well. I know the guys do as well. We're, you know, we're, we're about 10 years younger than you, but we've been working out for a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, am I going to get, am I going to hit new levels that I've never hit before, you know, for the, over the next 10 years? Probably not. However, a more fair comparison would be if you were to compare, and I don't recommend this, but Look at your peers. Your your light years different from other women in your age group in terms of fitness, appearance, health, and that kind of stuff. So the game now is less about hitting new new goals and records, and more about maintaining, more about trying to keep your your fitness. Now and that's I not to say we can't. What I lost though, because maintaining where I am now ugh, is a struggle. If I yeah. could get back to where I was five years ago, am I? Am, is that a pipe dream? No, I, I think mean, that, I realize I can't get you know. I, 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 yeah, no, no, it's no. it's possible, but I do want to say this: mm -hmm. of, of when I think back of all uh, the challenges I had with different types of clients, for sure, like a client that is is going through or gone through menopause is one of the most difficult times for me to help like her build muscle. It's just you you have to be you have to be at one of the greatest disadvantages of progressing the physique. So the thing that I'd have to communicate is and remind my my clients that we're going through this is to to have compassion for yourself, especially someone like you who has, you know, if you think this is not very fit, I I imagine you looked crazy. Uh, in your 30s or 20s. So you got to get that out of your head of comparing yourself. And I have. I've okay. tried to de identify with it and let it go. And that's why I'm here because I thought I have to figure out. But it doesn't, it, but it doesn't mean that you can't get a lot of that. I, I do believe you can. Yeah, because um, that muscle memory is real. Yeah. And you've been training for so long. Mm -hmm. You've probably experienced a great deal of muscle hyper hyperplasia. You know, studies on, on people like you, people who've been working out for a long time. First off, the amount of volume and training that's required to keep what you've built is really small. And the amount of training that is required to get back if you did lose anything is also very small. So this is going to be a game of what's the appropriate dose? How do I manipulate my training properly? And dialing in nutrition. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that she's on MAPS 15. I yeah. love that. I, love, I think MAPS 15 is great for you. I would like to see what we could do about your sleep. Now you said you're doing all the things to try to improve your sleep. Yeah. Uh, and I do it all right to the point that um, I've been chasing it for years, literally. And I'm trying to sit in a different energy with it and reaching out. So again, I'm a functional medicine health coach. So I have like all these clinicians okay. that I can work with and I'm supplemented beautifully. I'm on the right herbs. My nutrition is dialed in. Now I did screw up. I did not eat enough protein last year. And I'm super aware of that, which was working against my goals. That said, you do get less hungry as you get older. It's yeah. just crazy. So mm. eating a hundred grams of protein or 110 grams of protein, that's a lot. So I'm even supplementing essential amino acids to, to fill in, right? Like I have all the tools available with nutrition. I have all the tools available with sleep and I'm still feeling like so many people out there like me feel. EJ, it's have you tried like biphasic sleeping or trying to make up for it a little bit in the middle of the day? Yeah, I just get into that. It's a great question. I just stepped into that a couple months ago because I thought I cannot keep trying for this when it's just not possible and I've been chasing it for so long. So yeah, I have been doing that. I have been trying to roll with my own rhythms more. It's really hard when you have a teenager, right? Like, oh, geez. I mean, you guys all have littler kids. I think, wait, one of you has an older kid. I have, too, right? I, have two, I have two teenagers, so I, okay. I'm, yeah. So like my body wants to sleep from nine until four. That's happy. Like, that's great. You can't do that. That doesn't work with kids. So my sleep has really been off since I had kids and my oldest is almost 15 years old. 
Um, I am trying to figure out a way to, I've just pushed it and I've pushed it with hormones. I've pushed it with melatonin and a sleep specialist. I've really, yeah. So there's, I've done all the this is interesting. So there's some evidence and this is more, uh, and, and I've seen some, some articles. This is a lot of speculation, but there's some evidence that biphasic sleeping, right? So what am I referring to? Sleeping a, the majority of your hours at night, but then you get naps in the day mm-hmm. and that's where you get your cumulative kind of sleep. There's some evidence that, that that becomes more appropriate as we age, especially for women. So there's some theories around why women go through menopause at, at all. Cause men can stay basically fertile essentially, right? Uh, theoretically till the day we die, women at some point stop being able to have children. And so scientists have tried to come up with reasons as to why, like, why is that? What's, what's going on? And the best theories are that the role of the grandmother is very important uh, in society and tribes and her ability to to wake up in the middle of night. By the way, this happens to women when they have kids too, before they go through menopause. Anybody who's had a child will know, women will tell you they don't sleep like they used to at night. And this is a natural thing. They need to be on high alert. They need to be able to hear almost anything because a crying kid in the middle of the night is a dinner bell for predators. Yep. So, so the biphasic sleeping probably applies more to women and probably applies especially to women who have gone through menopause or perimenopause. So you, if possible at all, could you find a time in the middle of the day where you can do like an hour nap? Cause that might be it. That might be what you need. I try. I try at, first of all, I need to get a pod in the back of my house that I can just go to and sleep in. Like, and I'm not even kidding anymore. Yeah. Um, like that's like some soundproof pod. My family teases me about it. That would be ideal. That said, um, when I watch my sleep, when I'm napping, cause I do try to pay attention with devices, it's still just light sleep and it does help. I'm not going to say it doesn't help. It helps. But, um, in my REM and my deep sleep isn't terrible, right? As long as I go to bed early enough. Yeah. It might, I might be looking for too much out of that nap, right? Like, I feel like yeah, I might be looking for too much. Yeah, your expectations yeah, it's, are it's, high on that. Yeah, and also, it, it, depending on how consistently you do it, there's some evidence that shows that the more consistently you do it, the better your body gets at getting into or, or, or reaping benefits from those naps. The other thing I want to ask you, and you probably know this, you, you've worked with functional medicine practitioners and you've got the, uh, lots of experience with you, you avoid all stimulants, right? Or do you take caffeine still? So the only thing that I do in the morning is I am pretty attached to my uh, jasmine green tea. Okay. Oh, that's and when I say in the morning, I, it's usually at 6 a.m. I do have about 12 ounces and I am a slow caffeine metabolizer. I've had all the DNA oh. done too. So I, that is, I feel like I have given up alcohol. I've given up everything you know what i mean and so that is (laughs) ej try try getting okay so i i I feel you you really think that that that, that little bit yes because she's a slow caffeine metabolizer too i am and i know that i've seen it on paper (laughs) that means that the half-life so for people to understand that that means the half-life of caffeine for her double for her is longer so it's going to stretch out and still be somewhat active in her system when she's trying to nap okay for Hmm. example might not affect the night Day is it's going to affect the nap. I don't think it affects my nighttime as much, yeah. but if I do want it really, and you're right, that's a great, I never even thought about it in that way. Yeah. I need to pay attention to it with, I need, oh damn, like what's left? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Lisa, oh, I do want to circle back on something that you already mm. said and you know, um, it be, the, the consistency around uh, a higher protein diet while you're strength, especially someone who's built as much muscle as you have in the past, that could be part of the missing piece of why you're not getting it back as fast as you want is if you're inconsistently hitting those protein intakes, that can make a big difference. And I know you already said, you, you know, I did now I okay. have been, and I'm a tracker. I've been tracking food for years. Um, honestly, I did for a year and a half. I played, I shouldn't say played. I, I was in ketosis, but in a very Mediterranean style, vegetable heavy, but not enough protein. I could only max out at about 78 grams. And, um, obviously I was working against myself. The reason I did it though, is because I felt like I couldn't educate anyone else about it. If I hadn't experienced it, experimented with it. Yeah. And let me tell you, it works for satiety for women who are hungry, man, it works. Yeah. We yeah. talk about that. Okay. Um, but 
I need 100. I'm shooting for 110. I try to get about 90 grams of animal protein. Yeah. And then um, I will supplement with some some great essential amino acids. And I will and I do eat plant protein, obviously, too. But I don't really count it, per se, trying to hit that 90 to 100 of animal. Is, yeah, is that, that the right? Yeah, I love that. I would I would look there's two. There's a few things I would try. And I mm -hmm. think that these might make the biggest difference. One is. And I know this is going to suck, but I would eliminate caffeine in the morning. So you could try caffeine free green tea. Um, yeah. if you need, if you, cause, cause there's also the ritual of drinking, you know, the green tea in the morning. That is it. So mm -hmm. I would, I would eliminate caffeine. If okay. you find that you still need a little bit of, you know, something you could try rhodiola for some people. I, take that. I do take that every morning. Um, okay. and I know combined with the caffeine yep. that definitely Affecting the naps, right? Because rhodiola is yeah. activating. Uh, so, so if I can stick with that and then, but dump the caffeine and. Yes. So I would do that first. Then the second okay. thing I would do is I would try to go in a bulk. Mm -hmm. And because uh, that, especially in women, being. I did do that. I did do that. Okay. I did that for about four months. I pushed my calories when I was keto, though. So it was a bulk. At a max of not the seven, same. eight grams of protein. Not so the, I, yeah, no, not the same. So, so the carbs, carbohydrates, especially in women, a, a, a lack of carbohydrates can cause changes in catecholamines oh, yeah. um, and neurotransmitters like serotonin, which, you know, a little bit of an imbalance there can cause sleep issues as well. So oh, I, yeah, acetone looks really good to me right now. I'm not going to lie. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I would try, I would try no caffeine. I would try a bulk with carbohydrates. You don't have to go crazy, but you don't go keto. Yeah, but what does that mean to you? I usually am only at about thirty or forty grams. Oh yeah, bring double it, at least double or triple it. You know. So what are your? I don't even know how to eat that much food? Any like, like I, you know, there is that I have hit that point. And I'm like I will stand at the counter and think I literally cannot put any more food in my mouth. DJ, this is when hyper palatable type foods can become valuable. Now I'm not necessarily telling you to eat. Garbage. I, I never eat those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm not necessarily saying eat garbage, but right. now this is when you could start to play with foods that you're like, ooh, this tastes really good. I like the way that this, you know, like I wouldn't recommend this to most people, but you know, like fruit juice is not is is an okay it's way to add a whole banana, maybe, or you know, there you go. Whole, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You know, you can make yourself a smoothie. So I would play with some hyper palatable foods. I would I would go into a, a surplus. I would eliminate caffeine. And then see what happens with that nap in the middle of the day. Have you ever done a stint of powerlifting, like a longer extended amounts of rest periods? Um, if you call that few years that I felt like garbage, that maybe so. I was working out and I'm definitely not a person that is, I'm not into cardio. Um, I don't work to increase my cortisol at all. I literally try to stay as parasympathetic as I can, mm. even with workouts. Um, that said, I played around with that. I do right now even have to take two days off at a time. What are you saying in terms of rest period? Are you saying weeks? Oh, no, 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 I think I'm talking about between, within the workout. He means between so, sets. Yeah, uh, between no, sets. I don't. And, and really trying to maximize your intensity of the lifts in terms of okay. like the load okay. Is, okay. is concerned. And I know like I like you doing mass 15 because of the maintenance right now and like your phase of right. life and everything. And I think right. that makes sense. But in terms of stressing the system and, and creating something where you're focused on more like optimizing muscle gain and like to sell mm -hmm. bulk mm -hmm. and all that and pairing mm -hmm. the two together, you know, might just a stint of that, like a month, you know, yeah. two months of it might. Moderate, moderate intensity, low reps would be a break for your body. If you're doing the oh, eight to 12. So same rest periods then in between sets. Yeah. Like that's three what you're minutes. talking about. Yeah. Three yeah, minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. Like all longer. Right. Yeah. All like, right. Like a minute. Yeah. yeah. So, All right, I can definitely do that. That'll take a little bit of self control practice to do it, but I can definitely do that. That's yeah. good, though. If you say that's a good sign uh, that Justin's on the right, hitting the right direction, if you say that would take a lot of self control, which means you probably don't ever really train in the three minute rest period. So there's some, mm -hmm. there's some value mm -hmm. there for you. Yeah. There's some value there. Yeah. I like that. I know it's hard because at this phase, it's like you got to like really like th consider so many different things to tighten and screw because you've had so much e experience. EJ, I have, so I have some experience with what you're talking about where I couldn't figure out what the hell was wrong with my sleep and I did everything and I couldn't figure it out. For me, it was simply, I was doing too much volume on my workouts and I didn't realize that that had that big of an impact. I dropped the volume. My sleep got greater. 
This may be something simple like the, you know, 30, 40 milligrams of caffeine you have in the morning. I mean, it, it could be that, it could be that simple. So I, I feel like there's something yeah. that you just haven't done yeah. yet. Starting that there is going to make, sure. the, that'll make the biggest impact. But I work out before the nap, after the nap. Do you think that makes a difference? Yes. But if it's too close, if it's before the nap, too close to the nap, you're not going to be able to sleep. So if it's like you work out and then and then you go 30 minutes an hour later you want to go take a nap, you might not be able to. I mean, I would I would recommend playing with that. Like I I mean, we can have some general advice for you, but I think there's going to be a, enough of a variance, you know, with the individual on how they would right. feel. I don't think I personally if I'm going to if I know I'm going to do like try and do a nap at noon or 1, I can't train in the morning. I've got to that's got to be cuz I if I lift, if I lift after you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, it affects my workout or my night, my nighttime sleep. So it's, I, I have to have, a, that's a, most people. Yeah. I have to have a pretty big break there. So, I mean, play with it, go do one, do some with before and do some after and, and see how you feel. All right. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. I felt like I'm glad you guys said that you think maps 15 and I am doing the, the, I, I played around with the first one, but I have stuck with the advanced. Um, that seemed the closest to me to a workout for someone like me. And I've even kind of recommended that to people. So um, I appreciate that the feedback you're giving me. Is yeah, no, that's a great choice. Put, put, let's yeah. put her in the forum. If you're not in our forum, I'd love to have you in there. EJ. I'd like to follow up and see what's going, you know, see how you feel. I'm not, I can do that. All right. Yeah, well, we're going to put you in. Offer for so many people like me that are floundering. I'm sorry. She, she I feel like there's a lot for for me to even offer other people in something yes. like that that are floundering like I am. Oh, like, I, oh this is selfish. I, I want you in the forum because I think you're going to benefit the other members in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I also want to hear how you do, but I think you're, you'd be a valuable ad <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you're that. You're hard on Thanks. yourself. Yeah, yeah, you're doing great, great by actually. the way. Thank yeah. you. So. I, and I feel like I am. I just, uh, I just, it's been a tough road letting go of who I was and, and inviting in who I am and trying to find like where I am in that process. You, you just That's, need, you just need, fun. You just needed a couple of young, handsome guys to pump your tires a little bit. That's all. So. You know, it's funny because I'm inviting you yeah. and you have wives that are not where I am yet. Yeah. So this is going to be helpful even for them when your wives end up here. Yeah. It's it's a lot. You know, we carry these kids. We grow these kids. Oh, yeah. We have kids. And then here we are. And it's it's a lot. Yep. For no, sure. No, 100%. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for calling in. I appreciate you all. Thank you. you. Right, Thank, you. Thank you. Take care. That has to be the the the, the Hard, hardest clients. Oh, hardest oh, clients. Oh, uh, I oh, look at this us is, trying to figure that out. <laughs> if there was, yeah, if there was ever, because um, it's like, are you doing this? Yes, you're doing that. Yes, yeah, are you doing yeah. this? Yeah. Probably. I, I, honestly, I'm gonna tell you guys right now. I bet you, I will bet this, and I hope she follows up with us that a bulk with some carbs and a and eliminate caffeine will make a huge impact. Yeah, there was a few things that I I caught there. Yeah. One. She she knew that she underconsumed protein. Okay, so and if you're trying to get back the muscle that you had at your your peak mm -hmm. and in your fifties, and you're already fighting against hormones, I find that that's going to be crucial right. that she stays that consistently. The fact that she did make the point when Justin mentioned the long rest periods of three minutes, she was like, "Oh, wow. she made a big deal yeah. that that was going to take a lot of mental," which tell which signals to me. That she moves kind of quick through yeah, her workouts. Moves, yeah. mm -hmm. If that would, if that's going to require She's discipline, discipline. So, so there's sense. there's definitely mm -hmm. value there. And then your point about bulking and the cutting. I mean, th there's some stuff there. Even though she's checking a lot of the boxes. I mean, that was the part that was so hard as a as a coach and trainer with a client like this that I, I would I get lost sometimes. Yeah. I feel like we were we were doing a lot of the right things and, and just not. And you know what it. happens? What's common with somebody who's a fitness fanatic? the place that they refuse to look at or the place that they really don't want to look at is usually where the answer is. Yeah. And you can see when she talked about her green tea in the morning, like this is the last thing that I, you know, the I very have. last thing. Yeah. Well, like, well, you hit it, you hit it too. Cause she, gone. she knows she's tested for it and she's, she's seen it. Yeah. You know? So she's not unaware, you know? No, so. no. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I've seen it make a huge difference. A lot. I ha I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm a slow metabolizer of caffeine, but I definitely metabolize slower than let's say like you guys. And I can see, I take my caffeine early in the morning too. And I see a difference when it's above like 250 milligrams for my night sleep. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that had a big impact. Our next caller is Shane from New York. Shane, what's happening? How can we help you, man? Not much, not much, guys. I hope hope you're all doing well. Could could go on for forever. I've been a listener since 2016. And um, you guys have done a ton to change my relationship to food, exercise. I mean, genuinely just have, have improved my life by 
a lot. So wanted to just say thank you, first of all, and appreciate everything you guys do. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Brad. Thanks yeah, I, support, I recognize man. your name for sure. I know we've chatted before probably on Instagram. Yeah. I, I DM you on Instagram every now and then. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I, um, I don't really know, you know, what necessarily like what the question is going to be here. I might just look, be looking for encouragement more than anything, but um, as I just kind of referenced, I've been lifting for a long time. I was a competitive power lifter in high school. So I've um, been lifting heavy weights for about 15 years and um, got really big this summer, was really strong and in a really good groove and um, eating a lot, making gains in all my big lifts and unfortunately injured a disc deadlifting um, to the extent like I couldn't walk, sit for a long time. So um, ended up in the ER, which, you know, eventually led to seeing an orthopedic surgeon and had a microdiscectomy surgery in September of this year. Um, so not sure if any of you have had clients that have dealt with something like that, but essentially first six weeks of recovery felt very easily. PT was getting better and better um, and unfortunately injured myself again. And for the next month was trying to rehab it, but um, ended up in surgery again. So I've had two surgeries on my spine in the last three months. Um, outlook for lifting in the future is obviously quite different now. So um, just was wondering, like, if you guys have had any clients, first of all, have surgeries similar to that and understanding like you guys are not doctors or PTs. And I'll obviously listen to my doctor's advice on all this stuff. But i um, just curious if you guys have had anyone go through something like that. Um, Adam, I know you had the ACL surgery. So um, just kind of like dealing with some body image issues as I see my body change and kind of trying to think of like what stuff in the future might be helpful um, or even now, like while I can't be in the gym, ways that maybe you guys have shifted your mindset in yeah, situations bro, like this. this uh, so you, I don't actually share yeah. all of it on the podcast because I don't think we've ever gone too deep on so this. many injuries. But yeah, I actually, <laughs> this is how this is. And literally it's around around the same time time frame as far as what how old I was so it started I think 28 was the first one so I actually tore uh, ACL MCL MCL then I ro uh, then I got a level three sprain in the, the next season right when I came back and because I wasn't going to hang it oh, up yet I bet the sprain was even worse oh the level Those three the sprains worst. were nasty so I got a level three sprain on the right ankle uh, the next season you know rehabbed all that stuff that d denied I'm coming back again next season I roll the other uh, ankle with a level three sprain same thing again. I'm still coming back. The next season when I when I blew the Achilles. And the Achilles was the final, like, okay, I get the sign. Okay, someone's trying to give me a sign here that it's time to start focusing more on health and maybe I'll just I'll slow down a little bit on trying to be the buff guy also playing basketball, which was not a good, good idea. So, yeah, I think this is kind of because you can definitely still be hella strong, hella fit, but you have reached a level probably with – lifting uh that's uh, elite and you still want to get after it that way and you're getting in a place in your life where maybe your priorities are starting to shift and so um it's a very common transition that we all go through and we all go through to different ages it's not like oh this happens at 30 i mean some people it gets prolonged till 40 something some people it happens as early in their late 20s uh, for me, it was around this time in my life, and I was stubborn and resisted it for a while. And then I just learned to take my competitive mindset and shift it uh, to other things. And if you've been listening for seven years, like you said, you probably remember this was when I became the mobility guy. You know, I was like totally not a, and it was hard the, it originally. I mean, I made it, I made it seem like it wasn't that difficult, but the it, the most difficult part was not the gym work it was the the mental side you know of of not being the super buff strong or basketball player guy and now I'm this you know guy that I used to make fun of the yogi mobility dude yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Shane Shane the, the micro uh dissectomy you got the same procedure twice and was it on the same disc or different Yeah discs? yeah L5S1 and um yeah, revision discectomy about three months later on Christmas Eve this year. Okay. So I'm about so, four weeks out from that. So that's sometimes they call that like a micro decompression. And so, so for people who don't know, so you have a herniated disc. They go in and they alleviate some of that by taking off some of the disc, or or you know, uh, they shave it. They shave the edge essentially. So, but it happened twice, same disc. So whatever's causing it is kind of still there. Right. Um, now I've trained people who've had this procedure. I've trained people who've had you know a lot worse than this and you could totally you could totally rehab to the point where this is no longer an issue but it's going to take some time there's some there's some compensations that you've probably created and there's probably some imbalances that you have you haven't been able to identify first off i would say this um you like to work out you like to lift weights i would definitely train more like a bodybuilder 
for a while than like a power lifter. I wouldn't train at all like a power lifter for a long time. Bodybuilding, the classic bodybuilding, I'm not talking about Ronnie Coleman bodybuilding because he did a lot of power lifting, but like, you know, Dexter Jackson bodybuilding. Like there's a reason why Dexter Jackson is, you know, it's almost 60 and he's never had an injury and he still bodybuilds, right? Bodybuilding is very much focusing on the muscle. The weight doesn't matter. Focus on the pump, the squeeze. There's a lot of longevity yeah. in that kind of training. And the reason why I'm, I'm saying this to you is because it's still fun. You're still building muscle. So it's not like this huge switch where you're like, oh my God, I'm not even lifting weights in, in, in a fun way anymore. So I would focus more on bodybuilding. I think a program like Map Symmetry would yeah. be phenomenal for some lateral like training would be huge. Huge. To, to stick with that for Yeah, a you might have uh, you know, a, a, an imbalance between the right and left that's causing some of this issue or some imbalances in the in, in how your muscles fire. Um, symmetry is phenomenal uh, at, at highlighting those types of things. I would do map symmetry and I would avoid the five by five phase at the end. In fact, I would have you do map symmetry yeah. probably two times in a row and then do more bodybuilding style training and then see how you feel after that. And then as far as your, your lump, you know, your, your spine is concerned, I would do box squats. I would avoid traditional barbell squats. I would do box okay. squats, real controlled, real slow, real stable. So real control. Don't, don't just drop on the box. That'll hurt your spine, but slowly control the descent, pause on the box, stand back up. I would do squats like that for a while. And then I would do trap bar deadlifts for your deadlifts for a little while, train like a bodybuilder, but let's start with map symmetry. I think map symmetry would be per and you'll build muscle. You'll get great. If anything, you might even get to the point where you're stronger than you were before because you, you, you've solved some of these See, issues. That's what I anticipate. And that's really like, I would steer you in the unilateral training for a really long time. Yeah. Like as much as like you can stomach in terms of like shifting your entire mindset in that direction and just really just paying attention to every little shift of your body, every little compensation that's creeping up and stop and, and really just, you know, regain focus, control and, and bracing and, and really just pay attention to all that stuff like exclusively. Yes. It's going to get mundane if you just go in the mobility direction and I get that I mean that's obviously something's going to benefit you but in terms of strength training and like really like just you know focusing in and harnessing that ability for your body to just maintain this really solid rigid uh, position I think will will benefit you long term to get back to a position where you're like I feel like strong and powerful again Shane what was your what was your your PR and deadlift what were you pulling gosh guys I mean like you know it really went up a lot this summer. So I hurt myself pulling uh, about 495 and I was just in, in demon mode after a breakup this summer kind of thing. So yeah, uh, I feel like the, the MAPS programs kept me injury free for a long time, cycling throughout and just got a little bit ahead of myself this summer, probably on a day I shouldn't have been in the gym after yeah, traveling. So you're getting to five yeah. plates. So here's what happens. Muscle imbalances when you're strong are really hard to identify because you've built patterns and you've strengthened those patterns to the point where you could pull almost 500 pounds. So symmetry is going to highlight that. It's going to open, you're going to see differences in how you move right to left, weaknesses, stability issues, stamina, fatigue. Allow the weaker side to dictate how many reps and what the weight you use. Don't let the stronger side dictate that. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. You're going to have to avoid bilateral training and heavy training for a while because when you train heavy, your body's going to do what it does best to lift heavy, which is whatever the hell you were doing before. Whatever imbalances or issues that you had before, that's your default pattern. And it's it's going to be hard for you to identify it if you continue to train that way because that's the best way that you move to lift that weight. You're going to have to back off for a while and, re and develop brand new patterns and the best way to do that is going to be bilateral, uh, unilateral training. Yeah, I like the idea of actually running symmetry and aesthetic and split. But when you run aesthetic and split, actually pulling out the exercises like the traditional uh, deadlift or the squat and replacing it with unilateral work. So literally, you could follow the program to the T, but just when it calls for a barbell back squat, you go do Bulgarian yeah. split squat. I would go symmetry sure. twice. Yeah. I would go two two rounds of symmetry, yeah, and I would the avoid first three phases, not the fourth. I would avoid the 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 last phase, and I would do that twice before moving to a, a bodybuilding type, yeah. uh, you know, type of. Workout. And then even when you go to the bodybuilding, run like I said. Yep. Do still do you, where we call for. A lot of bilateral stuff like this, the barbell back squat or deadlift, you switch it out to unilateral stuff, do Bulgarian split squat, do single leg deadlift. Yep. Um, and But you could still run the, the the nuts and bolts of the program. I think you get a lot of value from that. Yeah. Don't get discouraged because this is actually, you're if you do this right, 
you're going to be stronger than you were before. Right. Because you got as strong as you could with whatever imbalance that you had. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and you kept that, that imbalance didn't go away. If you, if for anybody who's listening, if you have an injury that you then have again, the exact same injury, that root issue is still there. Mm-hmm. So you hit a wall and the way you hit a wall is your body got hurt. This is a recruitment issue. So if we, if we figure that out, which I think symmetry will do for you, not only will you not hit that wall again, but you're going to go past, you're going to go be able to go past it. So this is actually, this could definitely turn into a good thing, especially at your age. You haven't even hit your the the age at which you can hit your max lifts. So you got some time. This will be a lot of fun. Do you still have got symmetry? The old man? Still got the old man strength coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, still you, got that coming. you got more time for that. Do you have symmetry, by the way? I do not have symmetry. Right, no. we'll, we'll send that to you, Shane. Awesome, amazing guys. I guess like Sal, one one more quick question, if I could. Do you recall you you mentioned you worked with someone with a microdiscectomy? Do you remember like? roughly how long after they were starting to get back into stuff. And of course I'll run this all by my doctor, but I'm just curious your they, experience. I, you know, the, 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 I've, so I had two people who I worked with, but they were not 30 year old, you know, people who could pull five plates. <laughs> they were, you know, they were in their forties, they were athletic. And, um, it took, let me think one person, it took us about six months. The other person took maybe nine months or longer, but we got them, they were the, better afterwards. They, yeah, we got them better. The key the key for you, Shane, is going to, and I, I love the advice of the, you know, lift like a bodybuilder. Like you really need to, you need to have the approach of, of just not caring about the load. I mean, if something, it feels light to you, slow the tempo down more yeah. like that. Feel the muscle. You, with your amount of muscle, your youth on your side, as soon as the doctor clears you to go, you're going to be fine. You're going to be just, but you have to approach it with that mentality and don't, don't get caught up with, oh man, I was doing this much before. Like you, you don't even think like that. It's think like a bodybuilder, slow the tempo down, squeeze the muscles. Like if you train like that, you're you're gonna be back and 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 make a moves pretty quick. Yep. You'll be right. Awesome, awesome. Well, really appreciate it. Love you guys. And uh, again, thanks thanks so much for everything you do. Really you appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you. Later on. You know, just as a person, just as a personal example, um, you know, I hit my the best deadlift deadlift I had ever hit previous to the one that I recently did. I was in my mid thirties. I hit six hundred pounds, and then I couldn't. Uh, once I got up to like, after that, if I got up to like 550, 560, I'd notice SI joint pain or hip pain. And it just, I couldn't get it back up to six for a long time. Then I got to my forties and you, you know this, I was telling you guys this, I haven't deadlifted in a while. I'm doing yeah. single leg deadlifts. I'm doing lunges and single leg exercises and I'm avoiding heavy squats even. And I did that for like eight months. And then I went back to the bilateral heavy training and I hit a PR at an age when I shouldn't have. So you can do uh, it, your limit oftentimes isn't necessarily your limit. It's what your body's like this any further than this, we're going to hurt you. And, uh, you, if you figure out what that problem is, then you're able to go past it's it. It's funny. Once I figured that out, like in terms of like when that starts creeping up and you notice these patterns of like my hip starts to bother me, yep. you know, my, it's always the same it, thing. It's too. the same thing that I immediately jump to unilateral training, go through a block of that to where I feel like really reinforced before I even come back to bilateral. Training. Yeah. I, I wonder how much we didn't get a chance to really ask him. Um, but how much digging he's done. Like, I, like someone like this would have tremendous value of like, uh, training and bare feet and seeing like the discrepancy from the left to yeah, right sure. like especially with something like like a deadlift like that like he may not even know it but you have a slight pronation on one side totally. stronger Just, feet is that's that's what's holding you to the earth right and and you know you know you can get away with it when you're a stronger young guy and you're lifting 200 300 four, but you start getting as it gets up that the, the the ability for it to be slightly off and to injure you is oh, man. the room for error is very very little yeah. so he could just he could literally be like this and just have this slight pronation on right on right up the connection yeah right now, up and, and, so, and I didn't want to share this with him I had more clients who were going to get uh, this procedure the I know I had a lot that didn't yeah. do it who then came to see me yeah and then eventually didn't have to get it the you see obviously you guys have all I mean seen, you when you go to a sur- surgeons are amazing. there's a lot there's a lot of controversy around uh shaving discs and stuff like there's, that surgeons are phenomenal but but when you go to a surgeon the answers that they have is based on their what they understand yeah, it's the one answer and so like oh you heard like we could do this yeah. but i've had i had two clients who had this procedure i had a dozen who were going to get it 
uh, who then came and trained with me. Who well, yeah, ended I've up seen, not having I've, to I've had clients in so. situations where you have somebody who has barely, you know, a millimeter out and they're in uh, crazy pain. Then I've had others that have like five millimeters. Feel nothing. Out, feel nothing. <laughs> yeah. And they, then the doctor's like, you, are you in pain? And they're like, no, I don't feel no big deal. Yeah. So, yeah, it's. I a, had one, it's, I actually it's had one, variance. I actually had one surgeon. We would talk about this and he said, oh, it's funny. He goes, Sal, if you took a hundred people out in the street with no back pain, and you did some imaging on their spine, 50% of them would have herniated discs or whatever. Uh -huh. So he says it's not, it's, it's a lot I've more complicated than people think. Yeah. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 